Please come to order. Please rise for the Star Spangled Banner, accompanied tonight by Ms. Howard. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. So far this year, we've made pretty good progress. We're three-fifths of the way through. If we keep up this pace, we could have record-setting uh, town meeting and shortness. If any precincts haven't organized, specifically two and seven didn't organize yet, they should uh, go out by the front doors and organize. Fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen upstairs in the hallway. 18, 19, and 21 in this hallway during the break. Yes, sir. 15 in the back corner? Okay, 15 in that back corner. Are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? What about it? That's all going to be over there in the side. 2 and 7 out by the front doors. 15 in the corner, 16, 17, and 18 upstairs, 19, 20, and 21 in this corridor. 16 is done. Good job. Thank you. 20 is done. Good. Well, if you're done, you're all set. Just come up and give Stephanie the um, sheet after, afterwards. Um, Mr. Ch Mr. Dunn. for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session when the meeting adjourns. It adjourns to Monday, May 6th, 2013 at 8 p.m. Um, Monday we're going to have, well, if we don't finish tonight, we're going to have Mr. Boquillen of Minuteman here, and also I think Vision 2020 is going to present their report on Monday. So we, but maybe we'll finish and they don't get a chance. Any announcements or resolutions? Mr. Chapdelaine. Uh, just two brief announcements. Uh, first, um, on the opening night of town meeting, Mr. Dunn mentioned that the town, school, and uh, unions are cooperating on a compensation study for the town. Uh, so I've placed a memo on all of your seats just detailing the process that we've followed to date and uh, our expected timeline going forward. We expect to have the process completed uh, sometime this fall. Uh, and just very briefly, the, so you know, the major impetus for the study was the Board of Selectmen's interest in looking at the comparability of employees' compensation after the town moved to the GIC. Uh, and second announcement, uh, as some of you might know, we are in the process of redesigning the town's website. Uh, so we have issued uh, a public survey on the website that I'd ask you all to take the time to take. You can find the, uh, the link uh, at the town's website currently, arlingtonma.gov, and we're just trying to learn more about our site's visitors, what they want to look at, how they utilize the site uh, so that we can optimize our design as we go through the process. So if you can take the time to do that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements, Mr. Harrington? Uh, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. I'm uh, rising because uh, the Arlington Republican Town Committee will be having a meeting at the Senior Center tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. 
told us that the other day, we remember. Um, Ms. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jane Howard, Precinct 10. Uh, I have an invitation for you all to do yet another cleanup on the 11th, and that is at the Spy Pond Trails Day. It will be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, as you probably know, we've put in over the years nine trails down to the pond using discarded curbing. This keeps people from eroding the banks, and this will be an effort to, to keep those things in good order and also to pick up trash. Uh, improve the trails, as I said, uh, probably prune for vistas. We work along with the Appalachian Mountain Club, and uh, we invite you to bring your lunch and just admire the work that you've done at the end of the cleanup. Thanks so much. Thank there's you, a, There's a pile of these in the back table. Oh, okay. So you can get your instructions in the back table. Ms. Weaver? Okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. And I rise today as um, the co-chair of the um, Arlington Recycling Committee. Um, this little flyer about Community Collection Day is on all your seats. I also sent the presentation I'm about to give to everyone on the listserv. Um, and you'll note around the, uh, around the room that there are recycling bins, so we can always recycle more, and there's an opportunity with all this vast amounts of paper to, to uh, save us some money by not burning it. Let's see if I can do two things at once. Okay, before I get into the community collection day, I wanted to give you a quick update on uh, where we have been and where we're going as far as reducing our solid waste. And we pay about 70 bucks a ton now, so reducing that saves us money. On the far left, that's where we started out, about 19,000 tons of garbage that we incinerated. On the far right, that's where we're trying to go to, 50% diversion of our municipal solid waste. And next, one bar in from that, the checkered bar, is where we anticipate being at the end of this physical year or shortly thereafter, where we will have, incre we will have decreased the amount of solid waste we incinerate um, through a partnership with you all. Uh, the residents, the DPW, and obviously the town manager and staff, um, by 38%. The net savings over that 10-year period is over $2 million. So this is a way to uh, stretch our budget uh, numbers further out. So I, we encourage you, there's always more things you can recycle. And thank you. Some of the, the Community Collection Day is one of the entrepreneurial activities that the uh, Recycling Committee uses its funds in, in collaboration with the DPW. This spring's Collection Day is on May 11th. It happens at the DPW yard on Grove Street. It's from 9 to 1. Don't come early. Don't come late. Um, you can drop off CRTs or televisions for 10 bucks that day. If you haven't picked up curbside at your home that day, you have to arrange the DPW beforehand. That's 20 bucks. Any other time, if you call them to tell them you want to take something away, it's 40 bucks. So there's good reason to stop by and, and drop it off. Also, microwave uh, recycling is free on that day on May 11th only. Uh, other electronics, anything with a plug, basically, other than appliances, those have to go into the white goods collection uh, stream. Call the DPW for that. If it has a cord, it goes. Um, there is a, a, a big hit over the last couple years has been uh, free secure paper shredding, two boxes per residence for free. There is no charge, but uh, we're start, you know, uh, continuing with our effort to do good while doing good. Um, we ask that you consider making a donation to the Iron Food Pantry in lieu of paying a fee, and we think that would be a great addition to our work. Businesses pay for all shredding. Free propane tank. You got that old one that doesn't work anymore? Drop it off for free. Another new thing we're trying out is foam or styrofoam recycling, all colors but no peanuts, okay? There's more information on the town website about these. Um, one of the things I think is the most um, uh, intriguing things that we do is the Bikes Not Bomb collection. So these are clean uh, adult bikes mostly, sometimes a few children's bikes, um, that Bikes Not Bombs takes 
and ships either to maybe Dorchester or overseas. When they go overseas, they can become a family's sole transportation. It's really quite an amazing thing. They asked for $10 in a donation to cover shipping costs. A couple changes here. In the past, we've collected um, prescription drugs and used syringes. The used syringes now have to be in one of those red official collection boxes. We'll be collecting those on the 11th. The prescription drugs are now, uh, you can drop those off 24 seven as I understand it at the community safety building. That saves them not having to have a police detail guarding the drugs so no one runs off with the old Oxycontin. Um, children's clothing and toys. Okay, the adult uh, clothes we ask you to bring to the Planet Aid boxes and other uh, things, Goodwill and around the town, but the clean used clothing and books for children we collect and those end up at the Little Fox. So with the, uh, that gives a revenue stream to the, the children's library. Um, books, DVDs, and CDDs, the heavy stuff, uh, the Stratton PTO picks those up and takes them up to a God books bin and they get money. They raise two or three hundred bucks every uh, collection day on that. And we're assuming Diane has gotten someone to collect the sneakers. We're back in the sneaker recycling business. Those will be turned into subflooring for um, athletic things down at Nike Town. Only a couple more, sorry. Metal recycling, uh, Mr. Um, Dan Warren of the DPW initiated this a couple years ago. Old pipes, poles, metal shelves, file cabinets, whatever. Again, no appliances. Bring them, they go, they go in the front loader and they go in a big bin and get taken away. Batteries, rechargeable and button batteries. Uh, a, a guy who sells batteries, I, I'm sorry, I forget his name, comes very nicely and volunteers his time to collect re rechargeable batteries. Again, the alkaline batteries um, are not like the ones many years ago. Those can go in the regular trash. Um, no cardboard collection. Please put that out on the curb like normally. And the Save Club will be there. You heard from them earlier this meeting. They collect returnable bottles and cans to fund their operations at the high school. Lots of recycling goodies available and free um, stickers, etc. All of this information is also available on the website. And as I said, I sent this presentation to the, the meeting listserv. Again, May 11th, DWR, 9 to 1. Don't come early. Don't come late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Um, another announcement. Someone left these nice glasses. They're, they're real prescription glasses. I don't think they're readers. And they're pretty nice. If they're yours, they're up here. I can't see through them. Um, any other announcements or resolutions? Reports. Oh, here's one more announcement. Uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, tomorrow, Thursday at 7.15, Snack is holding a meeting at um, 87 Medford and second floor. And I'm only mentioning this because Clarissa Rowe will be there speaking about uh, the conservation land, which includes Vista Park, Sims Woods, and um, the extended Vista Park, which is a 1.8 acre area and she will be discussing landscaping and conservation plans for those areas. So if anyone's interested, it's the second floor of the Armstrong Ambulance Building at 7.15 tomorrow night. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, um, Article 3, reports of committees. Uh, Mr. Cole, did you want to go first? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Cole, Chairman of the Permanent Town Building Committee. I would request that the report of the committee be received. Okay. All in favor of receiving the report of the Town Building Committee, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It is received. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, before, whoops, can we pull the curtain back there a little bit? Oh. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank everyone who has participated or contributed to the Books for Bill campaign. It's been enormously successful, and uh, we're looking forward to the day when uh, the Thompson School Library will be filled with more books than they know what to do with. Over the past year, the building committee has been very active. Um, do I have a way to advance the slides here? 
I just wanted to update you on the Highland Fire Station. There's been no building activity on site, but we did receive our official uh, LEED Silver Certificate from the uh, United States Green Building Council, the first building in town to be so designated. And I think that's uh, an achievement for the town as a whole. Now we're moving on to the central station to complete the work uh, that was started there last year when we uh, improved the envelope. The interior, as you can see from these two slides, is in very tough shape, and we have allocated uh, in the capital plan this year uh, design funds to design and redesign and update the interior to a standard equivalent of the Highland. The Robbins Library uh, roof is also on our agenda. We are replacing the slate of the original 1892 um, historic building as well as the 1931 wing in the rear, which is the, the children's section. Uh, we received bids for that last week, the lowest qualified bid, $383,000, which was below our estimates. Uh, when we add that to the uh, consultant fees, uh, we will be under our total project appropriation of 505,000. And that work will take place during the months of July and August when uh, occupancy at the library is a little bit slower than during the school year. The community safety building has been our main focus of attention this year. As you may recall, the, the meeting uh, allocated some money last year to fund a study of the envelope, including uh, investigative testing, water testing, uh, and other ways of determining both the cause of the leaks that have plagued that building for 30 years and trying to track down uh, the myriad damage that it has done. Uh, that report recommended replacing parapets, roofs, windows, curtain wall, penthouse. Uh, that work started last summer. It's continuing now, and we project that it'll be finished probably in the month of August. I have to tell you, it's been an incredibly difficult project for everyone. It's been difficult for the architect and the engineer, as uh, what we call latent conditions or unforeseen things have been uncovered as we got into those walls to replace uh, deficient masonry, steel, you name it. Uh, the contractor has not had an easy time either. Uh, he's trying to build uh, or rebuild in the building that's occupied 24-7, not easy. And his workflow has been stopped and started as we've had to reassess the unforeseen conditions as they come up. And lastly, it has not been easy for the occupants. Um, I commend the police department on their professionalism and forbearance. Uh, to work in a job site is not easy. Uh, the leaks have continued from time to time, and there's you know, construction noise and dust to add to it. Uh, due to the, the latent conditions, and I'll go over a couple, on the left, you can see they are replacing the, the large skylight also on the front. On the left here, you say, oh, that's easy. Look at they're standing on flat ground replacing those skylights. Then you look at the slide on the right, and you understand that to do that, we've had to make the atrium of that building into a jungle gym. That's two and a half stories of staging to get a platform up to the level where they could actually do the work of replacing those skylight panels. Oops. As we replaced portions of the roof, it was discovered that uh, the masonry, which you can see on the right, uh, was not reinforced when the building was built. We had to go back, fill those cores with grout, add uh, steel reinforcing as we went. And as we got into the stucco bands that you see as strips on the front of the building, um, 
we realized that the water which had penetrated at those points had traveled laterally and deteriorated the substrate that was holding the brick in place. So we had to remove large portions of brick and put in a new substrate to pin the brick back to. Uh, that has been slow and tedious, but I can say it's now complete. And we're moving on to the, the final pieces of the work, which are the replacement of the windows, the skylights, and the curtain wall, which is that large glass wall facing uh, Mystic Street and the courtyard. There have been some issues there. We're going to have to reinforce the framing to hold the new wall in place. And most recently, the contractor has put in a claim for additional, uh, additional time. Whether that merits uh, additional money is a, an issue that we will have to sort out with them. As of right now, that's, that's unresolved. So at any rate, we went back to the Capital Planning and Finance Committees a few months ago uh, seeking additional funds to deal with some of these conditions and we were um, through the hard work of Mr. Flanagan and others came up with $232,000 from other accounts which has been allocated to this project. Uh, going forward, the original capital plan projects two more phases to this project of interior reorganization and renovation. Uh, we have recommended that uh, they look at that plan and try and consolidate it into one phase because I personally uh, cannot bear the thought of putting the occupants through two more rounds of this. So in the conclusion, I'll say I'm frustrated. Uh, I'm not embarrassed, but I'm frustrated. This has been a difficult project, but I'd like to assure you that at every turn, we have done the right thing to make sure that this work is done completely and correctly. And that we will turn this building back to the town as a capital asset, not an operating liability. Oh yeah, and we had to replace the uh, cooling tower and the mechanical system, not scheduled in this phase of the work, but it basically failed in the middle of the project. Happy news, Thompson School. <laughs> we're, we're getting down to the finish line. Uh, I can report that the final mechanical systems, the finish work and the site work are underway. These are photos taken this week of the exterior. That's wow. the, the main lobby on the left, the typical classroom on the right. Uh, the project will be turned over to the school department in July. Uh, we are within our budget. And I think uh, Superintendent Bodie may speak to the uh, school department's um, plan for the school and their reaction to it to date. But thank you, and I'll be available at the back of the hall at the break if anybody wants more details. Thank you, Mr. Cole. We appreciate the work of your committee. Um, Mr. Schlickman, where'd he go? Well, Mr. Judd, you just get, Judson Pierce is going to get up and start the school committee report. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, uh, honorable members of town meeting, I request the report of the Arlington School Committee be received. All in favor of receiving the report of the school committee, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Is so received. A little nervous here. Um, folks, my name is Judd Pierce. I'm uh, Precinct 11. I'm proud to chair of the Arlington School Committee. Mr. Moderator, Madam Clerk, elected officials, honorable members. Today I was reminded of an interesting definition of democracy posted by a professor, my alma mater. I think he said it in 1956. Thinking independently together. I like it. That's what all you do here uh, in April and May every year. That's what we as a school committee try to do and accomplish. We have a lot to be proud of here in Arlington about our schools. We have a strong, rigorous, 
vibrant learning community. According to our 2012 MCAS data, Arlington is overall a high achieving district with moderate to very high student growth. The majority of our district grade level scores are in the top 15% in the state. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to introduce uh, our superintendent uh, to speak more about uh, our success successes and our goal of improving our district daily. Uh, superintendent of Schools, Dr. Kathleen Brody. Good evening. The school committee. I'm very pleased uh, this evening to be here to give you a short report on the Arlington Public Schools and its FY14 budget. My report will address, let me get this clicker right, will address these six topics. This morning we had this um, PowerPoint and uh, sent to you electronically, as well as the link to a more detail of the Arlington Public Schools budget. And for those of you that are watching this evening at home, you can find both the PowerPoint and the uh, budget detail on our website. The Arlington Public Schools um, are growing, and they continue to grow. Since 2000, we've had an increase of 20.6%. Since 2005, what that translates into is a, the equivalent of another, another elementary school. I believe that the Arlington, town of Arlington receives great value in our schools. As uh, Judd Pierce said, we are high achieving um, and high growth district. But our per pupil cost is considerably less than the, the state average. At 12,600, the state is $1,000 more on average. These are the FY12 numbers. The FY13 numbers have not been released yet. Looking at this year, some of the key highlights I want to give you is that the new Thompson School will open in 2013. This has been a much awaited um, project. I can tell you that those the people that have visited the school could not be more pleased in how it's turning out. It is going to be a wonderful school, very bright, um, state-of-the-art technology, and it is going to come in under, on budget, and it is going to, we're going to have occupancy at an earlier date than we have had with any of our other elementary schools. Another accomplishment this year is that together we were able to uh, eliminate our kindergarten fees um, and the chapter 70 uh, reimbursement has actually exceeded our projections for the, K the kindergarten recovery. Our expenses right now are tracking slightly below budget, budget and our grants this year grew at uh, an increase of 7.9%, which was greater than our budgeted projections last year. Um, but we also received, and this doesn't even include this number, um, a, um, a Project Success Elementary Counseling Grant for $1.2 million that will be paid out over three years. We have begun central registration uh, for our elementary schools in order to um, implement our redistricting plan. We have a shared vision of the Arlington Public Schools, and that is that every graduate of our school will be ready for college, career, and active citizenship. And we will continually support our staff with professional development to continuously improve. And we will do this in a very cost-effective way, and I think that's evidenced by um, our, our per pupil cost as compared even to the state average. And we will do this in partnership with all of town departments and with collaboration and communication with all the stakeholders um, of the Arlington Public Schools. When we were uh, developing the FY14 budget, um, we had many priorities. Uh, chief among them was that the budget would fund our educational strategy, 
while also meeting our contractual obligations. And accomplishing both with, while operating within the framework of the town's uh, three-year financial plan. Other priorities that we have had was that the Thompson School would open with uh, full staffing comparable to all of the other elementary schools in town. That we would provide the professional development necessary for full implementation of, of, of the Common Core state, uh, uh, state Standards that will be fully tested next year on, on the State Assessment uh, MCAS. And also professional development for the new uh, Massachusetts Educator Evaluation System. We wanted to enhance instructional support at the elementary and the middle school for mathematics and provide the curriculum materials that are aligned with the core standards, both for mathematics and literacy. We also want to expand our world language offerings at the, at the middle school and high school for global education. We have also um, increased our substitute salaries because in this regional market we have been, um, we are quite below the, the, the average. But also one of the important uh, goals for next year is to increase the professionalism of special education at the elementary school in order to provide more support for our teachers as they support and address the needs of all students in, the, uh, in their classrooms. This next graphic um, gives you a visual overview of the type of support that we provide our elementary classroom teachers. On your left, you will see that the special education resources consist of a team of special educators, psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists, physical therapists. We also have two learning specialists, and this is where the, the, the uh, major change is this next year. Instead of having one learning specialist in each elementary school, we are going to have two specialists, as well as teaching assistants to support them and the students in the classrooms. There are also district resources and general education resources uh, available to the teachers. So funding this vision. Um, our, our revenue next year will be over 52 million, which is about 3.9% greater than our budget this year. So that translates into slightly less than $2 million. The majority of those funds come from the town appropriation which is slightly over $2 million, but we have um, a projected grant decrease of, of over $24,000 and a fee and reimbursement decrease um, next year. And the grant, re the grant reduction is mainly due to uh, federal sequestration cutbacks. But one thing that we um, have instituted, which I think is going to be, which will prove and has proved to be very helpful, is that we, are u we have developed a cycle where we're using this year's um, circuit breaker reimbursement to um, uh, fund the FY14 budget and, and we'll have that same pattern next year. So this year's payment will fund um, the, the, next, the next year's. The advantage of this is that we know what the circuit breaker number is. In the past, we've sort of had to wait and find out what the, what the rate of reimbursement would be and we wouldn't often know that until the fall well beyond our, our time of projections. Um, this particular graphic gives you an overview um, of our budget revenues, and I think the thing that I want to point out about this is, is that the t school department revenue is different than town in that not only do we have town appropriation, but we also have uh, revenue from grants and uh, fees and reimbursements. This next graphic, which again is in the, the report that we gave you, um, gives you an overview of the budget expenses by major category um, for our FY14 budget. And here, and I will leave the, this slide with you, um, are some of the highlights uh, that you found in your report uh, that demonstrate the success of our programs, the success of our students. And I want to conclude by saying that we are very proud of our students and we are proud of our teachers and staff whose hard work, competence, and dedication support our students in achieving at these very high levels. 
Thank you, and we will be available later for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Bodhi. <laughs> any other reports or committees? Mr. McKinney. A slideshow too. Uh, Lawrence McKinney, um, Precinct 7, Chairman of the Uncle Sam Committee. After such extraordinary uh, work done in both the plant and the uh, minds of our people, I come to you with a slightly less uh, complex report, and I hope you will find it edification and perhaps even entertainment. No guitar today. Well, I know, you all want it, but may maybe later sometime. All right. Um, in nine, you've heard about dissolving committees. Now, as you probably know, um, I, for a while, was standing up here saying, if this committee doesn't do anything, you should dissolve it. Well, thank goodness, in 2008, I was appointed chairman, and we actually did our first town day. Well, we had a problem. After years of inactivity, we only had $334 remaining in the account, just enough for a new banner, the tent, and a prototype bumper sticker. We also did the first Arlington survey to learn that Uncle Sam is a popular but neglected town resource. Okay, better? Okay, we also did the first Arlington tourism survey. Uh, we learned that Uncle Sam is a popular but neglected town resource. We did displayed George Jovellis' Arlington painting and welcomed officials, and thanks to Diane Mahan for catching me in the act. Our first report was 2009. Town meeting came, and seated next to the early committee member, Bob Hillis, I actually put on a suit. Our proposal to fund a t-shirt project through Arts Council failed. What to do? We delivered survey results. The committee is running on empty. 210. Town meeting tosses a lifeline. With our initial funding proposal, $2,500 for a tourism survey rejected, we try for $500 for a logo. With the creation of a new tourism committee, some feel we are no longer necessary, but TM members Dick Smith, L.C. Fiore, and Hugh McCrory speak up and we're mini-funded. Hugh McCrory joins, and we work on a real logo to tell the story. Cost to the town for all the design work? Zero. A Craigslist contest winner's gift, leaving us enough money to buy the buttons for Town Meeting 211. We discovered we had a bigger job ahead for Uncle Sam. We had a freestanding statue, but no site connected with it. Wilson's colonial past in Arlington was almost unknown. Every visitor or tourist walks by the Uncle Sam statue. It's our unmanned, inexpensive 24-7 focal point. We lobbied for more attention. We attended six MAPC planning meetings in three towns, as well as six tourism committee meetings to ensure Sam Wilson was represented in any funded colonial projects. The byway failed, but we had a focus now. Town meeting 212, not the same song and dance. To be an attraction, Uncle Sam had to be a site. Lexington promoted its colonial history with a well-lighted sign statue out in front with good signage. What do we have? No signage, no information, you can't read the inscription, no lighting, no planning. We have a statue, we have a space, what we needed was Uncle Sam Plaza. Everyone passes this spot, so, no, so many attractions, let's step up for tourism. We've had hundreds of sites of that one, I think you all remember the doodahs of that night. We approached Mike Ruggieri, his landscaping firm was familiar with the plot, he joined the committee. We forgot to ask for any money. Well, anyway, the selectmen liked the idea. We still had the tent and the banner and now buttons, so we were there for town day again. We did a second tourism survey. Everyone liked Uncle Sam Plaza. Committee members got, we get to work with public works and we start fixing the place up. 212 town meeting, let a little light shine. Uncle Sam Plaza was gaining momentum. At this point, we had cost the town about $850 for three and a half years, but we finally knew how to approach the Finance Committee. Lexington Minuteman, Jefferson Cutter House, and Sam's Invisibility Cloak. <laughs> <laughs> we asked for $500 to light the statue, $500 for an 1812 bicentennial birthday party, and $500 to start designing an, a sight sign to tell the story of Uncle Sam. Finally, a tiny budget, and we have work to do. 
Uncle Sam committee greets the town on Patriot's Day. And we had meetings with Mike Rodemaker and Wayne Chenard to fix up the lighting details. And the most potent thing we could possibly have gotten, Elsie Fiore, who helped us out in 210, joins the committee. By September, it was ready. Public works didn't charge for the light. On town day, we served hundreds of cupcakes and ice cream snacks. And the O'Brien and Carl Wagner joined red, white, and blue frosting. It felt like a plaza. From 2008 to 2013, on less than $2,000. 213 town meeting, signage and synthesis. Working with Tourism Committee on signage and tourism building project, it became clear we need a good site sign. These days, any sign can cost thousands of dollars, but since we have now created a historic site, wouldn't it be great to have a real historic site permanent cast metal sign? This is the Jason Russell historic site sign. Would we qualify? We qualify. It's a site, not just a statue. We found the people. Colonial Brass, the authorized manufacturer of replacements and replicas, has the original molds. They'll make us one for only $2,500. Authentic, permanent, and just in time. And there it is, Uncle Sam Plaza. Near this spot stood the birthplace of Samuel Uncle Sam Wilson, patriot participant in 1775. His Troy packaging plant fed the soldiers of 1813. His popular nickname associated with U.S. on the barrels gave us the term Uncle Sam for the United States. We also found total support for our town management to return printing birthplace of Uncle Sam at the bottom of all official Arlington stationery. Happy 200th anniversary of the term Uncle Sam, first heard in September 1813. We got two winners here, tourism and of course, Ed Markey. And thank you all for your help and for giving us the opportunity to put this plan in action. We've had many helpers and we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Committee and to the Uncle Sam Statue Committee. Any other reports or committees? Seeing none. Um, Mr. Tosti, Q. Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor of laying Article 3 upon the table, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Nope. Okay. And that brings us to Article 25. As I said the other day, I'm going to step down at 25. And Mr. O'Connor, our assistant, is going to take over. Mr. O'Connor. <laughs> Article 25. Go ahead. Um. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Dunn. Moderator. I'd like to introduce the Director of Assessments, John Spidell, who's going to give the explanation. You have the Selectman's comment already written in the book in front of you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is John Spidell, and I'm the Director of Assessments, and I'm here to talk to you about more in Article 25, which is to establish a minimum value of $2,000 for personal property. Um, I'm sure many of you are wondering what personal property is, so he's going to read a definition from the Department of Revenue's website. Personal property generally includes tangible items that are not firmly attached to land or buildings and are not specifically designed to or, or of such size and bulk to be considered part of the real estate. This includes merchandise, furnishings and effects, machinery, tools, animals and equipment. Um, for fiscal 2013, <clears throat> we had 649, 647 personal property accounts uh, for a total value of over $100 million, which brought in roughly $1.3 million. Um, what we're trying to do is eliminate some of these smaller accounts. and. Uh, we have 196 counts valued under $2,000. They're, uh, the total value would be $228,000. Um, the total tax dollars would be $3,100. And if you 
got a two thousand dollar tax value on personal property would amount to a twenty seven dollar and twenty two cent tax which would be six dollars and eighty one cents per quarter so we're hoping that the town will uh, back this Warren article Are you concluded? Um, yes, I'm concluded. Okay, before we begin the speakers, please disclose any conflicts of interest or personal financial involvement you may have in this article. We can follow the town bylaw. Thank you. The first speaker is Paul Baer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Baer, Precinct 13. Uh, who, who gets tasked, who, who gets taxed for personal property? I've never gotten a bill for it. Uh, in the town of Arlington, it's mainly businesses. Um, the, the biggest uh, personal property taxes that are given are, out are to utilities. Um, NSTAR's value for the town is $31 million. Um, so basically, the top, I, I think the top seven uh, accounts account for approximately seventy million dollars worth of value. And how? What's what's a typical commercial establishment that now falls underneath this uh, new threshold? Um, it's basically a lot of the smaller businesses in town, like um, therapists, um, landscapers. Uh, would like uh, one of the major restaurants fall under they, or over? They are. Um, if you're a corporation, you don't get taxed on personal property. If you pay federal corporate taxes. Well, NSTAR is a corporation then? It's a utility, though, so it's handled oh. differently. Oh. Uh, and, and why is the $2,000 threshold picked? Why isn't it higher or lower? Well, we could go up to $10,000, um, but... Uh, the board felt that 2,000 was a good number. Okay, thank you. Bill Hainer. Up. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. The hundred, uh, the pieces of property, are they all, all owned by different people? Uh, yes. They're all separate, separate owners? Correct. Thank you. Andrew Fisher. Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Uh, just to be clear, the people who have less than $2,000 worth, would they pay a minimum on being the, that, would they pay a tax on $2,000 or would they pay no tax because they didn't reach the threshold? Two under $2,000 you wouldn't pay a tax. Over. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd, I'd like to mention that we picked the $2,000 number because it, we feel that producing the bills and having myself, the tax collector, the IT department, we have a vendor, by the time everybody looks at these bills and touches them four times a year, that it's just really not worth the money to generate it. Mr. Gilligan, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. Just to provide a little additional information, even though the threshold is $2,000, the typical bill is not a value, assessed value of $2,000. The average bill is less than $4. Remember, these bills go out quarterly, and each of these bills is averaging $4, uh, less than $4, about $3.85. Um, you heard Mr. Spidell talk about uh, some of the things that the town incurs with respect to costs. The IT department's involved, the assessor's office is involved, my office is involved. It's software, it's printing, it's cost of paper, it's postage. It costs us more money to mail and try and collect these taxes uh, than it's worth. We're, we're actually running in the red $2,000 per year. Um, 
it's even viable to look at a, an assessed value of 5000 but uh, my office and the assessors felt that $2,000 was a good place to start. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dean Carmen. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20. I have a 2001 Civic. I think my excise bill is 45 bucks. Is it worth collecting? That, yes. <laughs> but why? It's under 2,000. Oh, my wife's CRV is 450. So is that worth collecting? I should ask that first. Well, I, I would say yes, it is. Um, that with with the excise tax bill, it's it's more a something with the registry of motor vehicles um, than it is. So how much more incremental effort is there to get from an excise bill well, from my car to a personal they, property bill? With the excise tax bill, if it's under $5, they won't generate one. So Okay, but the threshold isn't 5 it's 2000 no, the threshold you're proposing. You're not proposing a thing well, under five. You're proposing. Well, it's actually a $2,000 value is a $22 bill, but a lot of these bills are, we're sending out at like $3. Right. So that's $4. really the question. So that's really the thing, though. It's, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's a 2000 anything under a $2,000 assessed value, which translates into a $22 tax bill is what you're exempting. So really right. the exemption floor is $22, not. 2000 in value, yeah, 22 and. So there's a difference, yes. So actually, the, my $45 excise bill, which I think is the state minimum, isn't it? Wherever that number is about. It depends on the car. Yeah, but there is like a bottom. But I think it's, so the number is 22 that was the, we're setting as a floor, not 2,000. Correct. Really. All right, thank you. David Bean. David Bean, Precinct 8. How does a piece of small personal property come to the attention of the assessors? <clears throat> well, um, if you're running a business in town, you uh, go up to the clerk's office and uh, it's called do doing business as, is that? and we get a copy of the certificate and then we would go out and visit the property if it was new. If it's new. S suppose I have, say, a good piano. Could I get taxed on that? Is it a business? No. Uh, then Does no. this affect only businesses? Yeah. In, in I see. That hasn't been said yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle DeRosier. Michelle DeRosier, Precinct 19. Has it been explored to find a more efficient way to collect the taxes rather than quarterly, perhaps annually? Um, <clears throat> I really can't answer that. I, I think that would be more Stephen's area of expertise. Mr. Moderator, could somebody answer that question, please? Yes. Mr. Gilligan, please answer the question. Okay, should please repeat the question. Has it been explored to find a more efficient way to collect the taxes rather than quarterly, perhaps annually? No, you can't do that. State law requires that, that all taxes, whether real estate uh, or personal property, is either collected twice yearly, every six months, or quarterly. There's no other alternative. It's the only way to do it. The town determined that it would be on quarterly billing, uh, I, I want to say 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it's a cash flow issue, it's a collection issue, but no, there's no other alternative. It's one or the other. Did you say every six months was an option? No, every six months is an option. Would that not lower the costs? No, it would not, no, not necessarily. Because it means that the burden is then placed on the town. What would happen is, with respect to cash flow right now, I'll use real estate as an example. We collect approximately $25 million every quarter for real estate taxes. If we went to six-month collections, 
Granted, we would be collecting 50, but we would cause the town to have a cash flow problem with respect to paying payroll and accounts payable. And it may come to a point at some time where we would have to borrow money. And then any savings due to mailing and postage would then be lost because the town's borrowing money. I'm not suggesting for real estate taxes, just in the case that we're discussing. It, it would, the, the concept is similar. It would apply as well. Not necessarily for borrowing, but if you cannot run real estate at six months and personal property uh, or vice versa at four months uh, at quarterly and then six months of personal property. Once you make a decision, you're locked in with respect to the state laws. It's one or the other. You can't split hairs. Thank you. Paul Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate. We have a motion to terminate debate. If all those um, uh, would like to terminate the debate, please say yes. Yes! All those opposed? No. I think that um, the motion carries. So we'll conclude with um, the vote. The vote is that the town hereby set a minimum state personal property tax exemption of $2,000 under Section 5. 5D of Chapter 39 of the Mass General Laws. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 All those opposed? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Moderator. That's an affirmative vote, and Jim so declared it. That brings us to Article 30, Town Budgets. Wait, 31, Appropriation Town Budgets. Mr. Tosti. I just want to make a couple comments before we start. Uh, this is all on B1 in your Finance Committee, hand, uh, your finance committee report. Uh, a couple of... Uh, differences that we did today uh, with this. The fiscal 2013 is not the same as the fiscal 2013 in last year's finance committee report because we've gone through and added in all the pay raises and steps uh, for pay raises in uh, 2013. So when you're looking at 2013 and 2014, it's sort of apples and apples. Uh, so um, that's one difference. And the other is occasionally you will see an unused salary reserve down the bottom. That's because when the things were originally done, it was just sort of a 3% number. But when we are actually started adding the numbers into each of the salaries, we, we occasionally came up with a little surplus. Those surpluses uh, in this fiscal year, in other words, 13, when the fiscal year ends, those surpluses will just all go back into the general fund for free cash. Uh, we stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, you know, at any time, either myself or uh, the manager or department heads. Thank you very much. Okay, dokie. Thank you. Um, we're going to handle the budgets the same way we have for the past several years. We'll go through. I'll read out the name of a particular department's budget. If someone wants to discuss it, yell out, hold. Then we'll go back, discuss those individual budgets, and then when we're done, vote the whole budget as a unified total budget. So to First one, oh, again, they made them really small. Finance Committee. Board of Selectmen. Town Manager. Human Resources. Informational Technologies, the IT budget. Hold. Budget six, comptroller. Seven, treasurer collector. Eight, postage. Nine, board of assessors. Ten, legal. Eleven, town clerk. Twelve. Board of Registrars, 13, Parking, 
14, planning and community development. 15, De development board. Hold. You really got to make these bigger. I can't see them. 16, zoning board of appeals. Hold on that. 17, public works. 18, community safety. 19, inspections. Hold. 20, education. 21, libraries. 22, health and human services. 23, retirement. 24, insurance. 25, reserve fund. 26, water and sewer. Oh wait, that's, what is that? That is a reserve fund of some sort. Water and sewer, someone wants to hold that? B, recreation. Robbins, oh, Ed Burns Arena. Council on Aging Transportation. Excuse me? Hold. Youth Services Division. And that's it. Okay, someone wanted to speak on Zoning Board of Appeals. Who's that? We're going to go back and talk about them. We got through them all. Those are the ones we're going to talk about, the ones people yelled hold on, right? What? Where are they? Oh, wait a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't flick back enough pages. Okay, Board of Selectmen. Sorry. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helm with Precinct 12. I um, just wanted to make sure there may be a typographical error on this that we should correct before we vote it. I noticed that in the personnel services summary, there's a, a noted change of less 11,522. But in the personal services breakout, I don't see that reduction accounted for. And in fact, the, um, the total personnel services and the breakout a few lines down is up 2.58%. Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, town manager. Uh, you need to combine personnel services, which are included under B, election and town meeting, along with the detail of personnel oh. services under the selectman's office, and that totals to the total personnel services on the top. Thank you. Anything else on selectmen? Seeing none. The next one that was held was information the IT department mr. Loretti and then mr. Leonard thank you mr. moderator Chris Loretti precinct 7 I had a question about the uh, expense line item for information technology and I'm wondering does that um, item cover software that's used by the departments within the town or are the departmental um, software purchases covered elsewhere, and I'll tell you in particular, I'm um, wondering about the um, Board of Assessors software. Mr. Good, do you want to field that? Uh, the, um, uh, David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. The uh, maintenance of uh, the uh, software uh, packages is covered in my operating budget. Uh, the purchases of uh, uh, the uh, software is uh, held in a capital line item. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moderator, I guess, while well, Mr. Good is here, I'm just trying to figure out whether I should ask this question of the Board of Assessors or not. I'm wondering, I noticed that the assessor's database that um, the public might see online has a new interface from Patriot Properties, and I'm trying to find out whether that was something that the IT department um, was responsible for, or was that a uh, assessor's 
decision? Uh, Patriot Properties is the, uh, uh, the, the vendor that manages the, the assessor database. They have a variety of different front ends. Uh, the uh, front end that is uh, currently uh, on the website is a module that uh, we purchased from them. Through the IT department? Uh, through the IT department uh, with, uh, at the request of the assessor. Okay. I guess what I'm wondering is, there, are there any plans to come up with a more uh, user-friendly front end in that module? Because in my opinion, the current front end has considerably less functionality than the previous um, uh, version that was out there that I believe was created by a volunteer in town. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing things like trying to find out how many gas stations are in town, with the old front end, you could do it in about two seconds. With the new one, it, it perhaps would take you 20 minutes. And I'm wondering, uh, within this budget, uh, are there any plans to um, bring back the old functionality? Yes, there is. Thank you. Is, is that budgeted in FY214? Yes, it is. 2014. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, in past town meetings, I've noticed in, in the budget where all the figures are, usually when there's a uh, position removed, we would see something that would denote it in the section of that budget, which would say like five and then parentheses four, which would tell the common person we've deleted one particular position. I call town meeting members uh, to look at page 10, and on page 10, section 3, two positions in the information technology department have been deleted, programmer and data processing administrative assistant. But yet, if we look at B2, in the section for information technology is listed programmer and data processing administrative assistant with a salary attached to it for 2014 and not showing any kind of downgrading, deleting, or position being removed. I wonder if we can get a clarification on that, please. Mr. Tosti, is the format of the budget? You're talking about the reclassifications that we did in a previous article? I'm talking about on page 10, it says, by deleting the following positions in certain departments, two positions are named in the information and technology department, but yet a salary is labeled for them for the upcoming season of 2014 on page B2. Those, uh, when the budgets were created, that hadn't been voted. So the new budgets for next year will reflect the new titles. So can we say then that there is no programmer and no data processing administrative assistant down for 2014? Mr. Good. I'm David Good, uh, Chief Technology Officer. The uh, programmer position uh, has been reclassified to a network uh, desktop operations uh, uh, support person. The uh, administrator uh, position is a position that uh, uh, Ruth uh, Lewis, the controller, and I had shared, and that position is being moved into my group full time. So we, what you'll see in, in my group in the past was half of that salary for the administrator, and now uh, my department will, will absorb all of that. So that's sort of an even swap. The um, programmer position, although the title has been eliminated, we have uh, uh, kept the position, reclassified the function, and kept it in the same uh, job category band. So again, because I'm not the sharpest tool in the box, both those positions as we see it in B2 have zero salary? Uh, no. Mr. Chaplin, you want to go after <laughs> Adam Chaplin, town manager. 
<clears throat> so, so what's happened is basically there were positions that were reclassified. So on page 10, you pointed out two positions that were deleted from the classification plan. But earlier in that warrant article, you'll see two additions to the classification plan, which represent the new job title for those reclassified positions. So as Mr. Good just mentioned, those two positions will basically uh, remain similar to what they are, but they've been renamed and reclassified. So they, they are funded. There's no positions being eliminated. Simply, the classification plan is being cleaned up to be current with what the actual job titles will be. I, I understand with it that the money is being changed over. I'm just saying that it's just too bad we couldn't see what the new names were, if you follow what I mean. I follow that, yeah. Yeah? Because it, it shows that a l later on in the budget, which I won't get into right now, it happens in other sections of the budget also. As uh, Chairman Tosti mentioned, I think it would have been presumptive for us to change the name of the title before town meeting voted on it. Thank you. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I just have some informational questions, Mr. Moderator. Yes, sir. So um, I'm looking at this um, information technology budget, and I notice that there's um, a, a, a little footnote says additional 900,000 in school budget. And so 600,000 is on the town side and 900,000 is on the school side. Is that the way I should read this? I believe so. Okay, so um, is it true that on the school side will we see a breakdown like we do here and vote independently on the school side section of the um, information technology budget? Uh, Mr. Good is shaking his head no. Yeah, that's, uh, and so. Oh. Yeah, he's gonna elucidate further. Uh, hi, Dave Good, uh, CTO. Uh, that uh, uh, the school uh, IT budget is voted on with the rest of the school departments uh, in, in mass. So, so my understanding was that, you know, um, they combined information technology, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great idea. I think it's, you know, it's worthwhile. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but I would have expected that, you know, we can talk about the detail and see the detail and, and vote on the detail here. Mm -hmm. um, theoretically, we could change some of the detail, um, but we're not able to do that on the school side because of sort of the Ed Reform Act, right, that we are. Right, true. And so when the departments were first combined, was it more of a 50-50 split or is it, you know, is, is the trend that more of the IT budget is gonna be sort of an untouchable bucket on the school side or, you know, uh, you know give, give me a little history, please. Uh, untouchable meaning, uh, I, I don't understand that part I, of the I question. I think he means untouchable. The town meeting votes their budget in mass. We can't tell them how to spend their particular dollars. Correct. Thank I would you. think if you want to talk to them, you got to go to their meetings and say right. whatever. Okay, so just um, when the budgets were first combined, for information technology, was it the same 90-60 split that we see here? The budgets were never combined. Okay. The department? The department spending? Pardon me? I think he's, he's referring to the entire department budget uh, between the school and the town. Was right. it always they, the same? They were never, they were never combined under, under a budget. Oh, okay. Okay, the, the, the school budget for IT sits in the school budget, and, and the town is, is as we see it here. And they've both been relatively stable? And to your knowledge, they've both been relatively stable at the same levels over the last few years? Oh, well, the, the, uh, the school IT budget is growing based on some of the uh, uh, technology upgrades that we've done uh, uh, in, in the infrastructure arena, and, and the towns will grow a little bit uh, for the same reasons. And, and uh, I guess that's you know, part of what I'm saying is um, if I, I look at the percent change, I look through all the budgets, and. Now, this is a 21% change, so it's not small. And, um, you know, not to be able to look at most of it sort of at the same level and try to figure, is that also a 21% change on the school budget side? No, the 21% change uh, reflected in the town budget represents a uh, request for a new position, which is a systems analyst. It represents the half of the salary being moved to my budget for the... Uh, um, administrator, yep. the $12,000 uh, for salary increases and uh, longevity. 
I think it's $106,000. So, Mr. Moderator, would it be appropriate to ask about the systems analyst? Because I see that as 70% of that change. What is, um, you know, I see program is in systems analyst. Mm -hmm. So, are, are you developing um, software? Or what's the role of the systems analyst? So, the role of the systems analyst will be to assist uh, departments in their uh, identifying business processes that can be uh, automated uh, for efficiency purposes. So we have a we have a sort of a hole in 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 our, in our department where we don't have a, an individual that can actually uh, do process flow work with departments that don't have uh, technology um, originally and don't have people with technology skill in the department. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Good. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Um, Ms. Lacourt? Yes. yes. Anyone else on IT? Seeing none, we're going to move on. The next one that was held was Treasurer Collector. Who wanted to talk about that? Uh, Mr. I want to say Coke, but I don't think it is. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, in the Treasurer budget under personnel services, we list uh, position of deputy treasurer showing a 4% salary increase for fiscal 2014. Um, my understanding from looking at the treasurer's website is that this position is presently vacant. Are there plans to fill it? Mr. Gilligan, do you plan to fill that position? Yes. Thank you. We need redundancy up there. Um, next line, management analyst shows a 8.6 percent salary increase rather more than the three and a half percent for the whole department what's going on mr gillen can you come up and explain the changes in your budget thank you mr moderator stephen gilligan town treasurer yes the management analyst position uh increase includes uh not only uh, a, way, a salary increase due to uh, collective bargaining, but also a step increase with respect to the pay and classification plan. And it just so happens that that doubled up this time around. That's what okay. that is. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Anyone else wish to discuss the treasurer? Uh, Ms. Maman. Serena Memon, um, Precinct 21. I would like to know why the expenses have gone up on this uh, from for the 2014. Well, uh, did I miss a step here? No, I think Mr. Tosti is going to give it a go first, Mr. Okay. Gilligan. There's two reasons, but the major one is that an expense which was formally netted out of tax takings. Uh, is no longer to that can no longer be done. In other words, in process of tax tailing, uh, takings, uh, the expenses were netted out of the collections and the money went into the general fund. Hmm. The Department of Revenue, which is the regulatory authority, said you can't do that anymore. Uh, you have to appropriate the money. Mm -hmm. So we had to appropriate $11,000 in this budget, and that's the lion's share of that. So we're really not spending any more money. Okay. It's just instead of uh, taking in money, netting out the expenses, and putting it into the general fund, we're taking the whole thing into the general fund, and we have to appropriate the money here. So that's really the lion's share of it. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else on the treasurer? Madam. Hi. I'm Kayla May, Precinct 20. I just have a question about something that shows up here, the overtime for past years isn't even 5,000, but because it's in the past, it seems like it ought to be varied and we should know what it is. And it comes up in some other places. Parking does the same thing. So I just wondered if someone could account for what that means. Um, Mr. Gilligan, you can speak to your budget. If it hits on the other ones, all the better. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Uh, overtime is, has generally been through the wishes of the Finance mm -hmm. Committee. It's been held at a, at a, a fixed amount. But overtime is really based upon uh, tax titles, tax liens for delinquent accounts, notices of foreclosures. Some years we're able to get that down through aggressive contacting of taxpayers, and some years it's a higher amount. And I'll give you an example. Uh, earlier on, we had uh, tax liens and notices of foreclosures 
uh, for 65 accounts, uh, but just last year it was 165 accounts. So that takes additional effort in order to deal with those delinquent tax accounts, and that's why you'll see variations in overtime. Well, what I'm confused about is that I'm not seeing variations. Well, the, the, you're not seeing the variations because where we have, if we have any funds left over in salaries for whatever reason, then, we, then the Finance Committee asks us to do an internal transfer to accommodate for that, rather than appropriate the money or ask for a transfer. There are years where we have actually gone to the Finance Committee and asked for a transfer, but we're not asking for that up front in the budget. We wait to see what happens near the end of the fiscal year. For example, right today was the tax day for real estate taxes. So starting tomorrow, we are looking at how many delinquent accounts we have, and we will contact individuals by phone and by mail in an attempt to get those taxes paid prior to the close of the fiscal year and advertising those accounts as delinquent. Now, right now, I can tell you we probably have about 700 tax delinquencies. Mm -hmm. It's our intention over the next two to three weeks, or, or certainly by the end of May, to get that as low as possible. In previous years, we've got it under, under 100. Uh, two years ago, it was about 201. Last year, it was 165. So that always fluctuates. If we have funds left over in salaries, the Finance Committee asks us to do an internal transfer. If we don't, then we're required to go to the Finance Committee and ask for a transfer out of their reserve fund but we appropriate the same amount of money in overtime each budget year. Okay, so once you hit 5,000, it goes to salary? From once salary? we hit, no, once we hit 5,000, uh, then you're right, we look at do we have any available funds in salary and or do we go to the finance committee and ask for a transfer? Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Mr. McCorry. Then after Mr. McCorry, we'll take our 10 minute break. If there's no one else for tre treasurer. Hume McCrory, Precinct 20. Uh, just a quick question for the Treasurer, Mr. Moderator. If that's, mm -hmm. um, given that Article 25 has uh, passed, what's the impact to, the, uh, to this budget um, in, in the Treasurer's opinion? Uh, I think the costs were exceeding 5,000, so. The, thank you, Mr. McCrory. Uh, Mr. Moderator, the $5,000 figure for the cost of the 197 personal property bills that this town just exempted yeah. was not just from the treasurer's budget. Oh, okay. It included expenses and costs from the assessors, uh, the information technology budget, the collector's budget, and the treasurer's budget. We looked at the impact on um, labor. We looked at the impact on, on cost of goods, cost of printing, cost of, of running the software program, and that added up to the $5,000. Okay. It will save us some time, yeah. uh, but I, I really can't quantify that okay. that's, standing that's here. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I have a quest another question about this non-existent deputy treasurer. And Mr. Gilligan, Gilligan mentioned that that position is currently vacant. I was wondering for how long has it been vacant? position has been vacant for a year and a half. First year and a half. Um, I think getting, and this question relates to the, um, I think one of the questions of the previous speaker. Um, in this budget, I think it's important to recognize that the 2011 through 2013 numbers are not actual expenditures, they are budgeted amounts. And what I'm curious about, Mr. Moderator, is there anyone can, who can tell us um, when I look at a budget, I'm used to seeing not only what was budgeted in the past, but the actual expenditure. And I'm wondering, is there any way for town meeting members to find out easily how much has been expended um, for the previous year for each of these line items? Mr. Tosti, as director of the finance committee, uh, head of the finance committee, can that be achieved? Because that would cut across all budgets. That's right. Yeah, I, I don't see why not the uh, budget that the manager submits to the Finance Committee in January uh, has uh, two years of, of actuals, and, and we look over that. Um, and uh, that budget, that's elect available electronically, so I don't see why that can't be done. Uh, years ago, we did try this, uh, you know, probably in the mid to late 90s, you know, we had two years of actuals. Um, 
so it was two years of actuals and, and two years of budgeted, and it just uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, it, it, was, it was more confusing than actually having the budgeted amount. So we went back to the budgeted amounts. Okay. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm aware of the, the manager's report, and it has a lot of good information in it, but the format's not quite the same, and, it, and I always struggle to try to match up corresponding items. So I, I would hope we could, could try it again somehow. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the treasurer? Seeing none, we'll close the treasurer budget, take our 10-minute break. Boys lacrosse team is selling goodies out there. Help yourself.
Board of Assessors. Who wanted to talk about Board of Assessors? Mr. Loretti, did you? Come on, let's go. Yeah, where is Harry? Who wanted to speak about Board of Assessors? Got 10 seconds. Okay, no one wants to talk about Board of Assessors. They must have left the building. All right, all right. Who wants to talk about legal? Someone held legal, Mr. Um, Harrington. Bear me with me for a second. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. So um, I'm not sure if this is where it would be. So uh, you know, I, I'm really just asking this question because um, all these questions because I'm a little bit confused about where certain expenses would show up in these budgets. Um, as we probably all know, um, or maybe we don't, um, Arlington has a civil rights lawsuit of a, a large one that goes to trial in June. And um, where, so Mr. Moderator, where in this, uh, would, would expenses for that lawsuit on the town side show up um, in the legal budget? Mr. Well, Mr. Tosti first, then Ms. Rice. Unless Ms. Rice wants to go first, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. Any expenses on the town side associated with that case uh, come from the legal expense budget, which is the second line that you see. So can you, um, Mr. Moderator, can, um, how much have we spent um, in fiscal year 13 um, on uh, legal expenses um, surrounding the um, uh, civil rights lawsuit? Um, 12 and 13, and I'm not exactly sure where the dividing line is, um, but the total is about $17,000. And how much have we incurred that hasn't been expended? None. So $17,000 for the complete preparation and expenses for- On the, on the town side. On the town side. Um, does that include any um, insurance no. um, expense? So um, could maybe Mr. Moderator, I don't know who the proper person would be, to explain, um, I guess we're insured, um, up to a, a certain amount. Uh, I'd like to know, does that show up under the legal expenses too? Is that insurance policy part of, um, was that used to pay part of the expenses for that lawsuit? The school committee holds an um, insurance policy with a limit of $1 million. Um, expenses associated with the defense of uh, both the school committee and various individual school side personnel have been paid out of that insurance policy. That has nothing to do with the legal department budget. The expenses I'm talking about are expenses incurred by me in defending the town, which is also a defendant. My understanding was that the, um, the court ruled that uh, the school department, just being a department of the town, uh, wasn't involved in the litigation and were dropped as I'm um, a defendant. It was all you know, the town of Arlington. I don't agree with that characterization. The school committee not the department, was dropped as a defendant at the motion to dismiss stage. And the reason for uh, the court's ruling was that, um, that those claims were precluded because they had been brought up previously in a state court case. So if I want to find out how much has been expended of the insurance in fighting this lawsuit, um, I'll have to wait for the school budget, Mr. Moderator? I mean, how much did the insurance company itself spend? Yeah, that million dollar policy that um, Council Rice mentioned. Um, if I wanted to know how much has been expended out of that million dollar policy, I'd have to wait until the school budget, or is it, I just don't know the appropriate Ms. time to is ask that, that question. Is that something we're privy to, Ms. Rice, how much insurance company has spent on the defense? Uh, I don't know um, the number exactly now. Um, yeah. I don't think it would be in the school committee budget. I, th I think it would be outside that mm -hmm. process. So, so when, when would be the appropriate place to ask that question, if not now? Well. 
That's the kind of thing I asked people to give Miss Rice a week or so heads up so she could get a real answer for you. I guess she could try and get it and have it for the next meeting. I believe the question was asked of um, Attorney Rice. I did. I have given an estimate of what uh -huh. I think. I'm not privy to that information because the town is not an insured entity. I've given that estimate is probably somewhere um, between four and five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And follow-up question, Mr. Moderator. Um, if, for instance, we were to um, um, lose, uh, my understanding is that it could be on the order of seven and a half million dollars. Um, would that show up in this uh, legal budget, or where would that? Where's the appropriate time to ask that question? It would not show up in the legal budget. Mr. Tosti, where, if the town got a judgment against it, where would you get the money to pay it? Yeah, where is it budgeted for a potential judgment? I'm going to take it out of the selectman's expense account, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there, there, um, there is no money specifically set aside uh, for this lawsuit. Uh, we, have, uh, we usually have a certain amount of money set aside um, in the general spreadsheet for court judgments. Uh, but that's a fairly small amount of money. Uh, if, if there was a court uh, judgment against the town for, say, several million dollars, uh, probably the first place we'd go would be the town stabilization fund, which it now is close to $3 million. Would we have to have a special town meeting, Mr. Moderator, to expend those funds? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, any, uh, any, fun, any appropriation from the stabilization fund requires a town meeting authorization. Now, my understanding is that, um, um, that Proposition 2.5 doesn't allow for uh, the judgments against the town um, aren't constrained by proposition two and a half would we be raising the taxes on the general populace to cover that stabilization fund withdrawal uh you know there's no automatic exemption from prop two and a half for a court judgment so uh it would either have to come from the reserves of the town and if those were not sufficient uh one way that that can be done is is probably special legislation to be able to borrow it or uh, and, and pay it back over, say, five years or something like that uh, would be a, another way to do it. I think there was a court settlement uh, for a substantial amount of money in a city near here, and I think that's how they handled it many years ago. So in, in the case of, um, um, so we didn't, we haven't budgeted for anything. The only reason I'm, you know, sort of pressing this point is, 30 seconds left, is that um, this case is coming to court in June. Um, do you, there's no place in the budget now where any reserves have been um, built up or put aside um, in the case of a um, uh, judgment against the town? No, we have not put aside any particular reserves for this court case. What we do, and this is really the purpose of the, of the permanent stabilization fund, uh, is for emergencies. So that would be the first place we'd go to, and that would require probably, you know, if this goes to trial in, in say, June, uh, and something happened very quick, which I can't anticipate it would, uh, you know, we'd need a special town meeting to go to that fund. Thank you very much. Anything else on the legal? On the sports fronts, the Celtics have won 92 to 96. Red Sox, 9 to 1 over the Blue Jays, top of the ninth, and the Bruins won 4 to 1. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> Um, anything else on legal? Seeing none. Planning and Community Development Department. Someone wanted to talk about that. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Uh, I have a question about the uh, trend in the, in the budget and looking between um, 2011 and 2014, it seems to have increased by roughly $180,000 from about 236.5 to 420,000 and change. Um, yet, based on my knowledge of the people in the planning department, um, I'm trying to figure out whether there are actually new positions created or is this just a matter of shuffling around the funding? Now, I, I do understand that the assistant director is now become the economic development coordinator um, or slash assistant director, but I still just trying to understand um, what positions are, represent that increase in spending. Mr. Tosti? Well, if, if you, if you tra track them along, of course, the big change 
was between uh, fiscal 11 and fiscal 12. Uh, and, and a lot of that is um, uh, cutbacks in the federal government for community development block grant money. So positions that were formerly entirely paid for with community development block grant money uh, are now uh, being shifted into the planning budget. Uh, otherwise, they would have to be eliminated. Uh, I think the director of housing and disability would be one, for example. Um, so, so that would probably be the major, uh, the major positions or the major reason. But I, what I'm wondering is, have we actually seen um, a change in the number of people working in the department over this period, or, or is that really the same? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think the, the positions were there, but they were paid out of community development block grant money. And as that has sort of gotten reduced, we've either had to eliminate them or to put, move them into planning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else under that department budget? Seeing none. Someone wanted to hold redevelopment board. Nobody wants to talk about it now. Um, <clears throat> Zoning Board of Appeals, who wanted to talk about that? Ms. Loretti. Hey, look, you have four minutes under your old clock. <laughs> you could have left it, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> um, Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, just a couple of quick questions. I'm wondering um, why there was a 22% increase in this appropriation from 2013 to 14. Mr. Trosty? Oh, Mr. Chapdelaine wants, oh, I don't care who wants to talk about it. Well, the, the, the big reason is um, the principal clerk um, and typist. And I'm not quite sure for how long, but there was a person in that position who deliberately was limited by his budget, it was probably another public budget, um, in how much he could make. So he was willing to take a lower amount of money because if he took a higher amount, he'd just, he just, he, he can't do that, he'd lose it on his pension. So that person finally left and they had to put in a person at the salary that was commensurate with the number of hours that was required. Um, so we, we got a break for a few years um, by this person who was willing to work at a certain level that person left, anybody else coming in working those hours would have to be paid at that higher level. I'm curious, is, is this position under the um, Board of Selectmen? I believe the Zoning Board of Appeals is under the town manager. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It is, even though the, even though the um, Board of Appeals itself is under the Selectmen. Well, they all, all, all those kind of, um, Adam, you can address this if I'm wrong, but all the, everybody reports to the manager, They're all, and he's their boss even though they are under this, appointed by the selectmen, right? Yeah, I mean, there's certain, yeah. uh, there's certain budgets which are uh, uh, technically under the board of selectmen, but it's really, the, you know, controlled by others. I think the zoning board is one. Uh, for example, the parking department is technically under the control of the board of selectmen, but the delegation has been to the, t to the town treasurer, so he basically handles that budget. So. I guess I'm, I'm wondering why, you know, that person is physically located um, where he or she is, and, and, and it, typically in a town, Adam. someone um, f doing the zoning functions would be part of the planning department. Um, the, as I understood it, the former person doing in that position was actually doing building inspections part of the time as well, and Mr. it just seems like a very odd, odd way of organizing things. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I, I have no knowledge that the gentleman that Mr. Tosti was speaking about was performing building inspections. Um, in my time here, this position was, uh, this position has been located in the building inspectors division, as you've mentioned. Uh, we've never had any internal discussions about moving it into the planning department. Uh, it's certainly something we, we could have a discussion about. Uh, I wouldn't characterize it as odd, uh, but uh, it's nothing that we've had any discussions about. Okay, thanks. Well, I thought, I thought this individual did an inspection on my own home, so. I'm not quite sure what to say, but thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoning Board of Appeals? Seeing none. Someone wanted to talk about public works. Okay, Mr. Trembley first, and then we'll get Mr. Kleiman, and then Mr. Warden. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. Um, I'm a asking about the annual question about salt. Uh, <laughs> So how much salt did we lose, Mr. Moderator? How much salt did Mr. we lose last year? Peter Fiore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. 
this year we used approximately 8,500 tons of salt at a cost of about um, $560,000. 8,500 8, tons of salt. Um, is, has the town uh, ever thought about uh, using some of the alternatives? Which alternatives? Well, I mean, there's other, there's other chemicals that the, that are, are the state uses uh, some, some uh, much nastier chemicals than salt. But, uh, uh, we have investigated. There is a, a, like a liquid brine mix that you can apply. Uh, you need to spe uh, purchase special vehicles and a, a tank to mix it and whatnot. We have looked at it. There are, it's a, it's a, you might get some cost savings on labor, but the material itself costs more. Um, it's something we are currently looking at, but there is an, no, um, other than the salt product we use right now, there is not a, a, a great alternative just yet. Now, we, we, would, are you looking at calcium, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sodium chloride brine, salt yes. brine, or yes. not, not magnesium or calcium or any of the other? I, I think we were, looking, we were looking at all the different options, yes. Okay. Um, because it's my understanding that... Um, the liquid brines stay on the road better. They don't bounce off. I mean, I, I know after some of these snowstorms, uh, there's kind of a salt fog in the air mm -hmm. on Mass Ave. You're correct. The liquid uh, product does stick to the road better. The challenge is with the liquid product is the, the road surface has to be a certain temperature, and if the humidity is a certain percentage, uh, it, it turns into a very slick material and can be more troublesome than okay. beneficial. So there are challenges to using that product, and uh, okay. those challenges are based on weather and temperature conditions. Um, I saw in the, uh, in the capital, uh, capital budget that you have uh, $17,000 for a new sander body. Is that going to have uh, have uh, metering devices in it? The the sander bodies we buy are for existing vehicles. Uh, the metering devices depend upon the sander body itself and the the vehicle it's in, being installed in. Those metering devices they work with the vehicle's computer to to judge the vehicle speed. Yep. Uh, a lot of our older vehicles uh, are not necessarily adaptable to that technology readily available so the newer vehicles yes we would like to install those meter those metering devices and any new vehicle we purchase a uh, large snow fighter will be specced with that type of equipment to better regulate the uh, application of salt but it's a challenge to put it into the, uh, the older vehicles oh i see so when you say a sander body or for instance taking the uh, sander off of one of the old snow fighters and putting a new sander on it correct ah, okay now I, I did see on the capital budget that um that you have uh, three hundred thirty thousand dollars for a uh, for a catch basin cleaner. It's a catch basin cleaner slash uh, jet truck. We use it to clear sewer blockages uh, or storm drain blockages. It's also used for uh, excavation purposes for construction. Oh, okay. So this is this is a, a vector, not Correct. not one of the, not the clamshell Correct. truck. Correct. Correct. And uh, are you replacing one of the trucks? Or? We are replacing an existing vac truck that is uh, older and um, undersized for what we need to do. Okay, so the new one's going to be a ten-wheeler, is the old one's a six-wheeler. Correct. Okay. Um, do you do you guys get to every catch basin? We get to just about every catch basin uh, annually, which we're going to have to ramp up based on new regulations coming out from the Department of Environmental Protection. So we will be there will be a schedule by which all the catch basins will have to be cleaned out or inspected annually. So so even some of the uh, more obscure ones on some of the little side roads you'll be looking at them there are no doubt that there are some that we probably miss uh, if anyone has a catch basin that for some reason the public works doesn't get to it we would be great to hear from the public so that we can get to those but any that we know about or are on our on our schedule we would get to okay um, all right thank you very much thank you thank you gentlemen uh, <clears throat> mr. Kleinman Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. Um, I rise to say um, I cannot have enough praise for the Department of Public Works. Of course, we know that we have snowstorms 
and that we need to have plowing done. But this past year, we had storms that we did not expect. And in East Arlington, for example, we had a microburst. That microburst put us in pretty dire straits. There were trees that came down. There were roads that were blocked. Mike and his staff, I cannot tell you how quickly they were out there. They were clearing the roads. They were blocking roads. They were working. And they made sure that we, who were in dire straits, were okay. And whatever we put in the budget is basically not enough. It's not enough for any employee, because our employees are really something. I don't know whether other folks in other towns work as well as our Department of Public Works, but I was just absolutely impressed, and I can say personally, we had a tree that came down incredibly close to our house, and within 24 hours, they, they removed it, and they, they, they were just amazing. So thank you to our Department of Public Works. Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. And I would also uh, uh, like to say that the Public Works that they, uh, uh, we had a situation in our street, I think it was uh, after the uh, hurricane, and there was a big tree that was uh, apparently wobbling around under the ground and disrupting the water and gas pipes, and it uh, 11 or 12 o'clock, the public works fellows and the fire truck and the gas company, everybody were out there uh, working on it and they took care of it and the people's house didn't blow up, which I'm sure they're very grateful for. Um, <coughs> but um, um, I also uh, want to say that I don't know who, who laid the new brick sidewalk on this the academy's side of uh, town hall, but it looks very nice. And um, I also have a brick sidewalk and uh, when I was coming home uh, tonight, I uh, noticed that one of the bricks was uh, disintegrated and there was a little rectangular space where there should have been a brick. And so I thought, well, I'll do it later. But then I thought, no, I'll do it now. It wouldn't take that long. Uh, so I went to the backyard and I found a brick and I got a trowel and I dug out the old brick and, and uh, put in the new one and it didn't fit and I had to dig out some more and I pounded it in. and and got some sand and put it around and... Did you and get a, a permit? And it, I, I, didn't, I didn't get a permit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, figured it was, I figured it was de minimis, Mr. Moderator. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, and so it's now, now you couldn't tell where that went in. And, and um, so that sidewalk is now uh, really safe to walk on. But then we came down to town hall tonight um, uh, we counted nine bricks, nine non-bricks, rectangular holes in the pavement just from the corner uh, up to the front steps. And I was wondering if um, somehow there wasn't somebody I mean, it, uh, in the town who could maybe do what I did. It took me 12 minutes, and I would not put myself down as a, a young or competent workman, but uh, that's what it took me to do, do this stuff. And if there were 10 of them, that would be two hours if they worked at the same, not very rapid pace I do, and so that we don't have those holes in our brick sidewalk in front of town hall. And I just wonder if maybe somebody could find a way to do that. Thank you. Will you address that problem, Mr. Rademacher? Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, I'll have someone take a look at that uh, tomorrow, uh, or at least we'll schedule the work. Brick sidewalks are uh, difficult um, to maintain. And uh, as you noted, sometimes as you start, you unearth more problems, and getting it to match isn't always that easy, but we will have someone look at it right away. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrington? Stephen? Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, so I have a question um, that's related to the snow removal. Um, the, my understanding is that for years we used um, the Sims site to, as a snow graveyard. And um, this year we used um, apparently an athletic field 
um, behind the stop and shop next to the high school. And so um, it looks like it needs to be remediated. I don't know if anyone's looked there, but um, it's, it was pretty well destroyed. And um, those were active playing fields. Is that in the um, current DPW budget um, to repair those fields? Mr. Moderator? Mr. Chaplain is going to tell us how he's going to fix them. So funds for the remediation, as you mentioned, of those, excuse me, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, uh, funds will either come out of the DPW budget or potentially take the form of a reserve fund transfer in FY13 uh, through the uh, Finance Committee. How much is the expected cost? We're expecting the mitigation costs to be somewhere between fifty and 100000 compared to the costs of trucking the snow out of town, which were estimated between 100000 and 150000 So that, that property that was used is school property, is that correct? That's my understanding. So um, how were you authorized to use school property for non-school use? I thought, and maybe this is just my you know, misunderstanding, that um, the procedure was for a different department in the town to use school property for non-school use, that the school committee voted it as a surplus property, then the um, town meeting decided which department got it, and then um, it would be turned over to another department in the town. How was this school property um, determined to be used for a non-school use? So the process, during, during the storm, uh, several discussions occurred between myself, the director of public works, and the superintendent uh, in regards to our need for a very large storage area. As you mentioned, Sims Hospital uh, was no longer available, or the Sims site was no longer available. Uh, the reservoir parking lot was not nearly large enough, uh, and there was really no other uh, site available, or currently no other site available in town uh, so in speaking with the superintendent and understanding that we would be putting limitations on the spring use of the field, uh, we decided that for public safety and the clearing of the roads, uh, to remove the snow, we, we would utilize that field. So, um, Mr. Moderator, is, um, this is maybe a question um, for legal. Um, is that um, permissible that a school property can be used for non-school use? Um, outside, I know it can be categorized as an emergency, but well, it does snow in Arlington in the winter, and it's got to go somewhere. And um, what it sounds like is that that's the only place next year that when it snows that you'll be putting snow as well. Um, so, um, you know, is this now the permanent snow graveyard? No, in fact, and I'll defer to town council for any uh, comments she wants to make on the permissibility. However, um, uh, just today, um, myself and the director of public works were having a conversation about working both within the borders of Arlington and outside of the borders of Arlington for finding, uh, as you've termed it, an alternative snow graveyard. There would, the, if we're going to remediate the field, as we've discussed, there would be no plans to again use it next year. Okay, and now part of that remediation, we know that that's a, is that a, um, a capped um, landfill site? It is. So um, is there any, um, mitigation expense um, you know for the uh, DEP to come out and inspect uh, it looks like because when I look at the field you can see you know the irrigation system was ripped up it's um, you know it's piled pretty high uh, it's a you know it's obviously a, um, a site that's so is that, has that been reported to the uh, DEP it has been in our private consultant that handles the, the numerous uh, landfill caps around town has come out and inspected and has found no uh, serious mitigation issues to be addressed Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Baer, Precinct 13. Uh, last July, we started the new trash pickup rules where you had to have a uh, recycling bin out and there was a limit of three, well, whatever, a hundred, pounds of, or whatever, I can't remember what the specifics were, uh, 100 gallons of trash. Um, I'd like to know how that has gone over with the public and are, are people following the rules, uh, have, have uh, are people complaining about it, have people been um, denied pickup because they've had too much trash or not a uh, recycling bin? Mr. Rademacher? Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, when the, the new rules initially became um, uh, policy, we did have a certain level of uh, complaints or um, folks calling. 
not quite clear on the, the different regulations, how many barrels, what kind of recycling, so forth and so on. So there was a, a bit of a learning curve uh, the first few months. I would say that that did quiet down uh, considerably um, and to the point where we don't get nearly as many calls now on, on uh, limits or recycling requirements. Uh, there were also initially some uh, folks that did not realize that they, that they could clear the apartment out or when they moved, line the sidewalk with um, uh, uh, belongings they didn't want to take with them and uh, were concerned that that wouldn't get picked up. But when we further explained the process and that the program allowed for a small fee to have additional uh, waste picked up, that seemed to uh, ease the pain there. So uh, I guess there was a learning curve, but currently it, it seems to be running a lot more smoothly. And do we believe that this whole program has helped that 38% um, increase or de decrease in trash that uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Gordon showed earlier? The numbers we have now as, we, as a trend towards the first full year of this contract are, are, very, are very positive. We're showing a significant decrease in solid waste collection um, in addition to the actual collection contract itself being uh, more affordable to the town. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Fiore. Peter Fiore, uh, Precinct 2. I have a question about street cleaning. Uh, and I, too, want to praise, praise Public Works. There was a broken gate down at uh, Thorndike Field a couple of years ago, and they came right down and fixed it, and uh, they did a good job. Uh, days that there's street cleaning uh, down in the Precinct 2, the area of uh, Margaret Street, Dorothy Birch, Thorndike Field, there's a lot of, there are a lot of commuters that park there. Uh, some are from Arlington, some are from out of town. I'm sure the uh, folks from out of town probably have no idea when the street's going to be cleaned. And so I was just wondering if it's reasonable within the, the budget to maybe get some temporary signage posted there in advance so that those folks in that, that really limited area could get their streets cleaned. I know at least one person told me he, he never gets it cleaned in front of his house because the commuters are always parked there. Is that, is that something that could be done, the temporary signage in advance alerting out of town commuters when, when it's going to be cleaned? Sure, uh, Mike Rademacher, Public Works. Uh, it, it is something that can be done. It, it is it, it's fairly uh, costly uh, and time consuming. We, we, we sweep uh, quite a few streets uh, at a time and to post all those neighborhoods with enough signage to get compliance uh, would be extensive. Um, we have struggled with that, that area specifically because of uh, commuter um, parking. Um, and there is no great solution. Uh, we've, we've discussed potential night work, but obviously that's disruptive to folks uh, mm. sleeping. So um, it, we, are, we do c constantly think about that and, and try to, to develop a way that we can do a better job in that area where the on-street parking is worse. Uh, but the, the posting of signs would be um, a significant cost. OK, if you'd maybe just consider, again, that, that kind of limited square, Margaret Dorothy Birch. Uh, within that, uh, it was just those couple of blocks. But all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, Precinct 19. I have a question for Mr. Rademacher regarding this spreading and the distribution of salt in preparation for the storms. We had previously discussed how the town policy was rather than plow to prepare the streets first with salt substance substances. And um, several members of my precinct contacted me regarding the metering systems because they found that their properties were getting covered with salt. And they actually reported that there was uh, property damage to their lawns. And is there any way to accommodate the needs for spreading management in areas where the streets are narrow and may cover their property rather than the street. Sure, Mike Rademacher, uh, Director of Public Works. It is a, a difficult uh, process. It's not much of an exact science, but um, one of the ways that we can do that is to have this other technology in the sander vehicles, the salting vehicles that control the rate at which the spinner 
applies it based mm -hmm. on vehicle speed. Uh, so there are, is some technology that can be incorporated into newer vehicles, which we are actively pursuing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a gentleman in the back. Did you have your hand up? I guess not. I thought you saw you raise your hand before. Uh, Ms. Sharps? Stamps. Yeah. Ms. Stamps. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3, and a member of the Tree Committee. And I was wondering if um, Mr. Rademacher could speak to what percentage of the $9 million budget it goes for um, trees, the purchase and planting of trees, and, um, and also give a very brief report on the state of trees in Arlington and how many we're losing every year, and how many we're replacing, and what the plan going forward might be. Thank you. Can you give us that information, Mr. Rademacher? I will try. Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. So I'm trying to remember exactly the questions here. Uh, trees planted, currently our program is we plant approximately 100 to 125 trees a year, which is um, regrettably uh, less than we lose a year. We probably remove, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but uh, due to disease or storms, we, we, we remove uh, on average about 150. The past few years has been greater than that. Uh, we had uh, Hurricane Sandy, the microburst, and uh, some other storms I can't remember the names of. Uh, so in, in recent years, we have not kept up with uh, the lost trees. To um, mitigate for that, in the budget this year, is an additional $40,000, which we would use specifically for uh, the replacement of street trees. Uh, and we would contract that out so that the work could, we can guarantee that work gets done by a vendor. Sometimes the difficulty we have with our own staff is we're busy maintaining the trees we have now and don't have the, uh, the manpower to be uh, planting trees all the time. The 120 or 125 trees we plant is with uh, town forces, but this additional money in the budget would be um, dedicated solely to hiring out uh, a planting program. As far as the percentage of my budget that is dedicated to planting trees, I don't know off the top of my head the percentage. I would say it's small. How many trees will 40,000 get us? Uh, if you're going to contract, when we, uh, if the town was to plant a tree, we basically, the cost of the tree is about $100, and then whatever our labor is to uh, contract it out, you're probably talking closer to $200 a tree to buy and install the tree. Under that program, though, the tree would have about a one-year uh, warranty, so if it failed over the course of a year, it would be replanted again at the vendor's expense. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Sean Harrington, already then, Jameson. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, in, in Precinct 15, uh, near on Morningside Drive, near uh, Teresa Circle, uh, the intersection of Teresa Circle and Morningside Drive, to be uh, exact, there's a very narrow passageway where there's a speed bump that's not painted at all. Um, if you're driving at night, it's very hard to see, and if you don't know what's there, uh, <laughs> I feel bad for your car. Um, and every winter, it seems to get moved uh, by the uh, storm, um, storm removal trucks, uh, and it's just moved back. And my question is, is whether or not, uh, Mr. Rodemarker, if it's an appropriate task, whether or not his uh, department can fix it, or if it's possible that they can fix it at all? What can you do about that speed bump, Mr. Rodemarker? Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. You'll have to uh, uh, help me out here. Is this a private way? Um, no, it is not. To my knowledge, it's uh, morning, Morningside Drive, or that part of Morningside Drive is not a private way. Oh, I'd have to look into it be because, uh, to my knowledge, there are no uh, speed bumps on public ways. Uh, well, so we'd have to look into it. If it's a problem on a public way, then we, we can address that uh, and um, either look into why it's there in the first place or fix it permanently if, um, if that seems to be the correct answer. But if it's a private way, we don't have a say in, um, in its uh, maintenance. All right, thank you. Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, I have questions in a couple of different areas, but since somebody's already started talking about trees, um, 
I was wondering if um, either someone from the tree committee or DPW can give an estimate of the total number of trees that we lost last year in storms. Mr. Tost is going to know. The number of trees lost approximately in the hurricane and in the uh, microburst was approximately 200. Mr. Mutter, I had spoken to someone from the tree committee, and the, and the number I was getting, I think, was closer to four or 500. And, and it really concerns me that there's such a huge discrepancy. Is there anyone from the tree committee who can answer that question? Mr. Tremble, are you on the tree committee? Can you answer that question? If you can't, it's okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. Ed, Ed Trumbly, Precinct 19. It was my understanding that, that there was a, roughly 165 trees or 150 trees per event, per big events, you know, about 150 from Sandy and about 150 from the microburst. But I am definitely not putting my hand on a Bible to swear to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chapdelaine might know more. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So the, the four to 500 number, that's the first time I've heard that figure. But based on what Mr. Trembley just said, it, it would seem conceivable to me that the number we've been reporting as 200 for downed trees was strictly a, you know, a tree that fell down and was removed. There was a great deal of other trees that were impacted, losing limbs or, you know, or, or a number of limbs. So there could be some um, you know, haze in the communication about how many trees were damaged and how many actually fell down and would need to be replanted. That, that could be the root of some of the, the difference in the numbers. Okay. Thank you. I'm, you know, I appreciate the, the additional budgeting um, or, or monies in the budget for replacing trees this year. As I did kind of a rough calculation in my head at $200 for a contractor tree and $100 for a, um, a town planted tree, there still seems to be a lot of trees um, that were lost that will not be covered by this $40,000. Is, is there the expectation that additional funding will continue in the future to um, try to replace all those trees that were lost? And will anyone be tracking that, either DPW or the tree committee? Mr. Chapdelaine? Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, so currently what DPW is doing is replacing trees that have both been lost based on the storms that are also being requested by residents who want the tree. There are some instances where there's a resident who may have been glad the tree uh, fell down in front of their home, uh, based on any number of reasons. Uh, however, our, the current plan, or, or my plan, would be to submit uh, in both next year's budget and in subsequent budgets uh, amounts to get back to where we need to be based on requests of citizen for trees. So I, I, would, cons I would consider this to be a multi-year attempt to recover from last year's uh, storms. Thanks. Is, is the message, though, to people out there that they need to make a request if they want a tree replaced? Um, it would certainly help us uh, if they made a request to know that they certainly want a tree there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mater, just a, a quick question on a completely different part of the budget. Um, in, under administration, there are a couple of part-time positions. One is the recycling coordinator, and one is the energy manager. And if I remember right, when discussion of those positions came up at town meeting, uh, one of the justifications for them was that the, either the energy savings or the increased recycling would pay for those positions. And I'm wondering if, whether anyone has done that analysis or has planned to do it um, that is specifically looking at whether the increased cost of hiring into those positions has uh, is, you know, it's directly attributable to any reduction in energy consumption or, uh, or increase in recycling that would justify those costs. Mr. Rademacher has. Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. For the recycling coordinator position, that position uh, was and is still instrumental in uh, helping to roll out this new uh, recycling and trash program we have, which Currently, we're estimating a savings of about uh, seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars this year alone, and which would pays, uh, uh, which covers quite a bit that person's salary. The energy manager's position uh, was just filled recently, so we don't have any data yet on the results of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. 
just quickly on Mr. Loretti's question, I think uh, the savings, we've only institutionalized fully the uh, recycling coordinator part-time position over the last several years. And, and like Mr. Rodemaker said, it's instrumental for the committee to, uh, recycling committee to, to uh, think entrepreneurially about additional things while the, the person in place, uh, Charlotte Milan, takes care of the day-to-day -day things that Mr. Rodemaker, uh, the savings of over $2 million from 10 years ago over that period of time, I think speaks to the efficacy of the program. Um, I, I rose to speak about trees. When I first moved to town, um, there was a program that the DPW ran that I took advantage of where you could, I don't know if it was adopt a tree or something, but I was able to go down to the cemetery uh, where behind the building there, they had a whole bunch of trees in the ground. They picked it up and I was able to get two very nice uh, flowering pears which have prospered on the berm in front of my house. And that seems like a very cost effective mechanism of getting more trees um, uh, out in town in replacement. Um, is that something Mr. Rodemaker might consider re reinstituting? Uh, Mike Rodemaker, Director of Public Works. I am aware that in the past there was a program where residents could. Uh, uh, request a tree. We obviously buy in bulk and get a good price and uh, there was a program where residents could uh, buy a tree at that price. I I'm not sure why it was discontinued but I I'm more than happy to look into it. I think it probably was discontinued when we were really really poor several years after I bought that. Uh, Maybe. I mean it didn't cost a ton any money. The residents yeah, yeah. still pay for like the tree. I paid like 20 bucks a piece. It was a great yeah. deal. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm happy to look into it. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Radomat, um, without you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. Uh, does anyone know what the cost to the town is for sidewalk repair from uprooted trees? Uh, there aren't many residential areas you can walk around these days without tripping or falling over something. It's usually a tree that has uprooted the sidewalk and then we have to go in and replace it. Any idea what the annual cost on that might be? Mr. Rademacher, can you answer that? Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. It would be difficult to specifically break out the cost of that. Uh, we have a budget of about $240,000 just for materials to repair potholes, failing sidewalks that the town takes care of, uh, aside from when we have larger projects contracted out. So it's a portion of that. I would say it's a significant portion of that that we use to repair sidewalks on an annual basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trembley for a second time. Uh, um, Mr. Moderator, if, if I could uh, uh, board town meeting here a little bit. A previous speaker asked about uh, uh, trees, and I would like to put on my tree committee hat and make a blatant appeal for the Trees Please Fund. Be there is a fund uh, that's handled by the Public Works Department into which uh, private uh, citizens can donate to the Trees Please Fund and that, uh, that little pot of money, and, and it does have some money in it, um, does in fact get used to replant trees and, uh, and, and generally help out with the tree situation. So um, we did lose a lot of trees last year. We're, we, we are working with the DPW and trying to, uh, trying to get some more trees planted and, and, re and re restore not only the trees that were lost, but also to take out, uh, uh, to re replace them with some of the trees, like Norway maples are an invasive species, and uh, they don't grow that well. So we're trying to replace them with, uh, with trees that are native and, and also do well, given that we, we flood their roots with salt, and uh, they, they don't have much water because the tree strips are narrow. They don't get a lot of water through the pavement. So the, the environment for a tree to grow here in town is not always the best. And uh, so the DPW and the tree committee both do, really do work at getting species that um, will do well as, as best it can be con uh, expected. And also we're, we're also taking a long view towards not having the trees interfere with the power lines too. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Ms. Stamps a second time. Yeah. Pass. And that leaves Mr. Chapman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roland Chapman, Precinct 12. I'll be very brief. The Trees Please program really works. For four or five years in a row, we bought trees through the program for $100 a piece and planted most of them up at Robbins Farm, and they do very well. And so we would like to make sure that the program is continued because we've got some ideas on some additional trees in certain places up there around the farm. So it's, it's a very good program. It worked very well. Thank you. And Mr. McCory. Hope it's not about trees. <laughs> Beat trees to death. Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. I'll also be brief. I just want to acknowledge DPW. I made a number of requests last year since this town meeting were, uh, for places on the bike path, and they were all uh, affixed. Th these were places where the tree roots had uh, basically uh, uplifted the, uh, the tarmac. So nice job. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Anybody else? That closes public works. The next one someone wanted to hold was community safety. Who wanted to talk about community safety? Sir. Uh, Len Carden, Precinct 20. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to ask, uh, with the superintendent being here tonight uh, in the hour, do we want to take the, consider taking the education budget out of order? Well, hopefully we're going to get through the rest of the budgets and get the education. That's only like one or two more, right? We're going to finish the budget tonight. Okay. We're going to talk about trees anymore. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so first, a couple of uh, general comments. Um, with, I appreciate the, the need to restructure budgets from time to time, but without also restructuring the 2013 budget, it's impossible for us to tell uh, what has been changed in, in here. So when this is done in the future, if you could do a pro forma of 2013, then we can see the changes uh, more completely. So it looks like there's a 2.8, 2.76% um, increase overall in community safety, which is you know below the 3.5 percent town plan um, increase. Uh, so, w one question I have is, uh, uh, in the police side, is is, is the budget um, being held to 2.8 percent, or is there a larger, is there something between fire and police that's, that we're not seeing here? Um, well, Mr. Tosti is going to address it first, see if he can answer your question. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question, please? So we're seeing a 2.7.6% increase overall in community safety, but we can't tell what the increase is between police and fire. Does it, is it commensurate, or is it 4% in fire, 2% in police? Well, if you, if you look at the, uh, um, the police budget, uh, it's going up. <coughs> Uh, considerably, yeah. I, I think it's reasonably level. There's there's no changes in the position and the personnel, uh, and that's that's eighty percent of this budget. Okay. Uh, and the changes in expenses. So uh, yes, I think they're equivalent. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of talk uh, just recently on the Arlington list, and it comes back from time to time uh, about policing in the community. Um, sort of uh, related to traffic issues, uh, bike en enforcement of, of, of bad, bike, bad behavior with bicyclists, bad behavior with driving. Um, and so that comes up from time to time. And I think this has been, has been addressed in previous meetings and, um, and the answer has been, you know, resources have been constrained. So my question is, you know, it, there does seem to be some, uh, some talk in town that this is a need that's not being met. I don't know if you're hearing it, um, if Mr. Ryan, uh, to the moderator, if uh, Mr. Ryan is hearing these concerns uh, or whether he really feels that um, things are being adequ adequately patrolled or not, um, or whether it still is a budget constraint issue. Chief Ryan. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Uh, so, so specific to bicycle enforcement, is that the uh, both the both bicyclists and speeding cars, um, right. and not stopping at stop signs, all sorts of bad behavior. We have um, five police officers in the training academy currently. We expect them to graduate in July, um, and upon their graduation, we intend to assign more officers to the traffic unit. We've also partnered with the Cambridge Police Department and the Somerville Police Department to work on a uh, regional basis on uh, bicycle enforcement. And we've trained up our officers and we're, we're making that a, a higher priority than we have in the past. And that can be done within the budget? Yes, sir. Basically not increasing? Yes, sir. Okay. And we're, we also uh, actively seek alternative funding sources through the Governor's Highway Safety Bureau to uh, perform those initiatives. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And then my, my other general comment is, as we move beyond the, the three-year plan that was part of the override, so starting in 2015, you know, I, I would hope that we take a more strategic approach to budgeting, where we're not just looking at the 3.5%. I appreciate that on the town side you came in at 3.4%. Um, but as we look, I hope we look a little bit more strategically about where are the needs. Um, you know, is 2% is right? Is 4%? Maybe one year we have to go 4% in some area, and then the next year we'll take it back down to 2%. Um, I, I think the, you know, the plan was good for three years, but we're moving beyond that, so hopefully we'll, we'll do a little bit more strategic budgeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to mention the word trees again. <laughs> um, but these are not the ones that we like to see that are, that are or should be uh, lining our tree-lined streets and so on, uh, or, or even those that are pushing the sidewalks up. Uh, these are in Mononymy Rocks Park. It seems to me there's an, a, 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 a very large number of uh, dead, fallen trees. Some of them are on the ground. Some of them have been on the ground for a long time. But every time I go up there, there seems to be more and some of them are kind of leaning in a kind of widowmaker position. But I, well, but the quite the reason I bring it up under the uh, the public safety uh, budget is whether the, uh, the 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 fire department considers that this might might be a fire risk because there's an awful lot of dry tinder up there in the park. Thank you, Chief. Is he over there? Oh, Bob. Here's Chief Jefferson. Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. Um, any type of um, brush that's excessive around town could be considered a fire danger. Uh, when the weather gets dry, it gets warmer, uh, we have issues down at Thorndike Field. It's, it's issues that unless, you know, Mike Rademacher gets another 100 guys to clean up Menominee Rocks Park, um, it's something that we don't really have the finances to deal with. As far as a fire hazard, um, any place that gets dry, that has excessive brush could be considered a fire hazard. Um, I don't know how we would deal with that other than, you know, we respond when that happens, but. Ma'am. What's your point? I think I can an um, answer Mr. Warden's question. As the former on uh, name and precinct. Oh yes, Clarissa Rowe, Precinct Four. When I lived in Precinct Eight, I took a yearly walk with Jim Dodge through the park, um, and we went. We looked at all the widowmakers, which are the the branches that might fall on people on the paths. Um, the friends also have paid for pruning of those branches for, I think, three out of the last five years. Um, I did move away three years ago, so I don't know if they're continuing that practice, but that might be something that you bring up at their friends meeting. Okay, that's yeah, not information, but Mr. Schlickman, that could have been a... Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, not to belabor the point or take a lot of time, but I do rise in my annual protest to state that one full-time and two part-time parking control officers for a town of 43,000 people five square miles with the density of cars and illegal parkers is absurdly small 
and that this is a revenue producing position, we should expand this and I hope next year I see improvement in this line item. Thank you. Mr. Harrington, Sean. Uh, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, in the last couple of years, we've seen some uh, sad tragedies um, with uh, suicides happening in public parks and stuff. I was wondering um, if the Chief of Police can answer whether or not there's been um, an increase in patrolling those areas since uh, that has happened. I would hope that's the case. I was just curious if uh, what they've been doing to try to prevent that in any way. Chief? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. So if I understand the question of uh, prevention of suicides in public um, parks? Patrol, well, patrolling the area because uh, I don't want to use names and stuff, but for instance, what happened at Menominee Rocks Park, uh, sadly with the young girl that uh, took her life up there, and then over here, in, oh, sorry, uh, and over in the garden, has there been more patrolling of public parks, public well, parks well, since? The, the parks and playgrounds are always a priority, um, mm -hmm. particularly um, in the warmer uh, weather and, and and seasonal. Um, so the answer is yes. All right. Thank you. Mr. Trembley. Precinct 19 and uh, you know the previous speaker talked about parking and uh, I, I rather like being able to shop in Arlington without getting a parking ticket. It's um, I don't go in Boston and Cambridge much because the, the meter people there are just too hard to deal with. Thank you. <laughs> Any, anybody else on community safety? Seeing none, the next step was held was inspections. Who wanted to talk about inspectional services? Oh, okay. Uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. I see this um, nothing budgeted for this for 2014 for Sims. Does that assume that uh, their development is going to be complete by the close of the year? Um, because Brightview may not be. Can Mr. Moderator? Can yep, he's, uh, the director's. Oh, well, Mr. Tosti is going to ah. address it. Well, the, uh, the permits are pulled at the beginning of the work. You know, before you can do X, Y, or Z, you've got to pull the permit and pay the fee. So the, the money tends to come in at the beginning of the process, not, not the end. Anything else on inspectionals? Education. Anyone want to ask about education? Mr. Leonard. Okay, let, let me see Leonard. Mr. Veraglu, right, Joe Curran. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, earlier tonight the superintendent mentioned that the Chapter 70 money that we'll be getting from the state will exceed the amount of $975,000 is, is what I understood. I wonder if she could elaborate to how much more than the 975 it exceeds and that the excess, what would happen to that excess would that go into the school budget for future use? Superintendent Bodie, do you have a hard number on that? If I could just perhaps, the amount that the Chapter 70 increased due to the change that we made in the kindergarten was, I believe, about what we were projected um, last fall. Um, in addition to that, there have been increases in the Chapter 70 in general. Uh, so it's not all because of that, but I believe it was pretty much on target uh, for what was projected. Is there any way Dr. that Dr. Bode, did you have a hard number? I think she had a, no, she doesn't have a hard number. Well, we don't have a hard number yet because the budget, state budget hasn't been approved. 
Um, but our expectation right now, at least in terms of the governance budget, is it would be $1.6 million in Chapter 78. Now, Mr. Tosti is correct. Some of that money is additional Chapter 78, but Chapter 70 is, is a function of your number of students that are enrolled. And um, because of, by having our kindergarten students now as uh, counted as a one, each child is counted as one rather than 0.5, we will, we, we, the number of students in kindergarten affects that number. So we had expected roughly to have about 1.2 to offset our kindergarten fees of in, in the 900s, but right now we're thinking that the Chapter 70 money would be 1.6 in that vicinity. It's not definite until the, the budget is approved. So just basically instead of 975, originally thought of we're getting back 1.6, at least for this time around. Well. Mr. Hainer seems to have some sort of information. Mr. Mr. Rock, moderator, may I? Yeah. Oh, what's with these mics tonight? Uh, Bill Hainer on the school committee right now. The, the one thing I, I, I can add is that the difference between what it costs for running the kindergarten, that if we get any extra money in Chapter 70 for that aspect of it, that goes to the town, that extra money. I just want to make that clear. So all the money that we get under Chapter 70 for having full-time students, we had half-time before, they're now counted as full-time. We got an increase of Chapter 70 money on that aspect, but only the money that will cover the expenses for the full-time kindergarten, the school gets. Any additional money coming in under that piece of Chapter 70 goes to the town. Is there a ballpark, Mr. Hainer? I, I can. No, no, okay. I mean, just, just to basically say, when we might receive this money, knowing that they haven't done their budget yet, probably in the state, are we talking July, August, or any idea? Mr. I can't Chef give you that. Did. Adam has a good guess on that. Adam Chaplain, town manager. So just a few points on this topic. Uh, when we came here in the fall for the special town meeting, uh, we asked for an appropriation from free cash in that $970,000 uh, $970, amount. However, it was anticipated that the Chapter 70 that would be received based on that change would be $1.4 million. So the amount that the current House budget, which was just approved last week, estimates somewhere between uh, just about $180,000 more than that from what we had anticipated in the $1.4. So as Mr. Hainer just mentioned, as part of the long-term plan, the funding or spending levels for the school department and the town are capped and any additional revenues that come in within the plan are then appropriated through the override stabilization fund, which are used to extend the plan uh, and, and extend the period of time before another override would be asked for. In terms of when the budget will be finalized, I would expect that a final state budget would be made available or approved by uh, both branches of the legislature and the governor probably sometime middle to late June or early July. Okay. All I really was interested in was basically something in the report, maybe moving forward next year or something that says, hey, we not only got our 975, but we got extra in regards to this particular phase with the school, you know, with the, uh, with the situation. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Verglu. Staff of Araglu, uh, Precinct 10. Um, uh, so I'm going to have a question about something that I think could be improved. But I do want to recognize that uh, based on the MCAS scores for whatever weight we want to give them as a measure of the quality of our schools, um, and also looking at the state rankings, um, we have a very great, um, very good school system. Um, I, I am appreciative of that, so please take my question with a grain of salt. Um, Looking at the MCAS English Language Arts, I, uh, I did a quick percentile measurement. We basically bounced between about 80 and 94th percentile. I'm not using the uh, state average percentage and the 2012 percentage. I'm looking at page 43 of the school report. So that's great. Um, it's sort of like noise back and forth. Um, and this is from third grade to 10th grade over seven years. We're in a very tight band. In mathematics, except for the third grade where it's at 63rd percentile, 
again, we bounce around the 80s to 90s. Um, the science, um, MCAS, there's a lot less data. There's only three years to look at. But the trend um, is unfortunately dropping. So by the 10th grade, we're in the 70th percentile, whereas we actually start near the 90th percentile. And so I think my question would be, and you know, as I've been reading this report, I don't really see, um, first, is this recognized as an issue? Um, I can't really see anything to that effect in the report. Um, again, I do think we have a great system. I'm just, you know, not everything will be in here. So one question is, is this an, is an issue? And then looking at the budget, I, uh, I don't really, looking at the science budget, um, it appears that we're spending less money in that area. I don't know if that's the right way to gauge what we're going to get. Um, we're spending less money this year than we have in last year by about $10 million. And um, looking at the district goals, I see the 2012 to 2013 goals. English language arts and mathematics are there. Uh, we're doing great in those, but science is not. So I guess I have three questions regarding the uh, drop in percentile, the way we're budgeting for it, and the goals going forward. And Mr. Moderator, if you would uh, yep. Dr. help me with those. Dr. Bode, can you answer his questions? Well, I think I can, if I can understand the question. First of all, thank you. I, I, I'm sure that all of the staff that are listening uh, appreciate your, uh, your, your comments. Um, is your question that we are reducing the amount of money that we're, we're allocating for science or, uh, or, suggest, or wanting to know what we're planning to do to improve science scores? Um, my main question is really, uh, how would we improve science scores? And I think the anomaly I saw, which you can take as an aside, is we've budgeted 90 million, in, or we spent 90 million in fiscal year 2012. We had 105 million budget for 2013, but the projected expense is 81 million. Um, and I think that's really, uh, maybe it's a red herring. I guess the real question is, there's about a, a 20 percentile drop from fifth grade to 10th grade. And, and I don't really care, if, I'd prefer we didn't spend more money to fix it, but I would like to know if there's a way to keep the uh, science percentile similar to the mathematics and English language arts percentiles. Well, we certainly um, uh, are focusing right now on math and, and math and English language arts because of the common core state standards, but we have not ignored science. In fact, th this last two years, we've been introducing engineering units um, in the elementary school. And um, we have probably not done as much in terms of alignment um, of our curriculum, uh, any work on, on curriculum development, because the, the new science standards really just were released two weeks ago. And I know that this is going to be a focus over the next year in looking at our curriculum um, at all levels to see how it corresponds to, to, the, to the, uh, the new standards. I think that one of the big uh, changes in the state standards that we're going to see is much more around project uh, hands-on um, uh, science. And, and I will say that Arlington has done a fairly good job in that area in terms of, of our science curriculum with the elementary, but there's more that we need to do and we need to make sure that we've aligned. It's a much more... Um, well, I, I, I think I may be going beyond the, the, the parameters of what you wanted to ask. But yes, we are going to spend more time looking at science, um, aligning our curriculum to the new standards. It probably is going to meet an investment in new science materials. Um, and we will uh, certainly see, hopefully over time, a, an improvement in our science scores. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Kerr, oh, what do you want? Talk about the science. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask, are you looking at the 2011 state average numbers, 69%, 43%, 52%? Because our last year, we, we exceeded those numbers by quite a bit. I'm looking at the percentiles. State rankings? I'm looking at the state ranking as, as a different, um, I'd rather compete against the other towns. Right. I don't really care about what the average in the, so I look at the percentiles. You guys can have a little side town. conversation if you want. Um, Mr. Curran. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Joe Curran, Precinct 13. And uh, I'm here to, uh, to ask a, a question, excuse my uh, paper, about, uh, about user fees um, for athletics and user fees in general. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I served on the school committee when one summer night uh, they decided to take a vote to cut cut out athletics, and I was very disappointed by that. I didn't I didn't approve it. I didn't vote for it. Um, being a physical educator, I should disclose the fact that I'm a phys ed teacher and a coach. I have eight children, and six have gone through the high school, and I'm very proud of the education and the opportunities they were afforded by going to a, a great school. And it was great to hear. Dr. Bodie talking about all the successes our schools are making. And one thing I do know is that as an educator, you educate the whole child. And the whole child, if you look at the foundation budget that was passed with ed reform, it says the one thing you don't want to lose is athletics. That's the one thing you want to fund because it brings a community together. Now when a storm comes, you take the patio furniture in, you put it downstairs because you don't want to lose it. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of opportunity, lost a lot of funding. The storm's gone now. Now when the storm's gone, you put the furniture back out and you enjoy the things that you already had. Unfortunately, we didn't put the furniture back out when it comes to uh, athletics. And I think our children, and I think a lot of kids have missed opportunities because my understanding is, is that when, when we first cut it, there was no limit to how much kids were gonna have to pay or how families were. So one guy, uh, one gentleman called me and said there was going to be upwards to 3500 bucks for his three kids to play sports at Arlington High School. Uh, that's quite dramatic. Um, then the, there was a lot of negotiations done, and a, a sports group got together, and they were able to cut it down, so the family cap is now down to 1250 When I was on the school, uh, when I first went on the school committee, the family cap was 500 bucks, somewhat palatable, something that, you know, you, you, you can handle. And I, I know my kids have all been through youth sports. You pay a lot of money. You pay a lot of money for sports. You, you'll pay the user fees because most people will, will you, you know, you take a look at a user fee and you say, wow, that's pretty absorbent. But try an arraignment, <laughs> you know. These sports do a lot of good things for kids. They keep them busy after school, keep them out of trouble. You can laugh about it, but it's true. And um, so I guess, guess my point is, is that uh, what has been done since the, uh, the storm has passed and money's getting better, I see that we're adding a lot of uh, personnel up at the sixth floor. We have a human resources director and some other, we're adding a lot of jobs, but we really haven't given the kids back what they had before the storm came. So I was just wondering, what is being done by the committee to try to reduce the user fee? Mr. Pierce. Judson Pierce, Precinct 11. Um, the storm hasn't passed. We still have Prop 2 and a half. We've had it since 1980. We have to do more with less. We are doing more with less. Um, if you note on page um, one of one, uh, the budget funding summary, under revolving fees and reimbursements, Mr. Curran, you'll see 417 uh, budgeted in FY11, 417,000. FY12 budget, 299. We put some of those deck chairs back Okay? okay? It's regrettable we have fees. It's regrettable we have music fees for people who play music. And I think Ed Reform talked about not only athletics being integral to a whole child, but arts. Oh, everything. Music. I agree with you. Absolutely. But you didn't mention that. But, but it's really important to note that it's the whole child that we're talking about. And what we are putting back are teachers in the classrooms. We're putting back, uh, you know, kids had gym once a week. Now they have gym twice a week. You know, we, we are adding back. But we are still dealing with a, with a limited resource. Oh, no, no I, right. I'm, I'm quite aware of it. I have kids in the school, and things have been added back. And you had it twice a week before the storm. Now, so I, I, I get it. It's yeah. going back. I have one other question, and that, that would be to uh, scholarships. How, uh, when people aren't able to afford it, how, are they, how is it afforded for them? How do we do that in the school department? Well, oh, Ms. Johnson. Well, I'm the one who calls on oh, people. It's my meeting, not yours. Ms. Johnson. <laughs> Diane Johnson, CFO, School Department. Um, we take financial information from families that request a fee waiver, and we use the scale set up by the CDGB um, block grant. 
we receive a certain amount of money from that grant to offset the fees we forgive from the students, but if we have students who qualify and we don't have enough CDGB money, they still play and they don't pay. But it is essential that they provide us with the documentation we ask for. Okay, can I ask you, how do you pay for the people that, my understanding is that this, there was $5,000 in CGB funds for, uh, for, the, for education I believe this year. it's eight. Okay, 8,000. If 10% of the students qualify, that would be a need of $50,000. Where does that money come from? It's absorbed by the school budget if we can't collect the fees because they can't afford to pay the fees and they provide us with all the documentation, we absorb that. But if they don't provide us well, with the documentation, that is where we have a problem. Well, how do you absorb, you absorb it from different accounts, or do, does it come from the when we when we set the athletic the fund we, we set the athletic budget for a certain amount of money. Um, Forty-four percent of it is offset by fees. The remainder is offset by the by the general fund, and by uh, ticket gate ticket Pierce Field rental. Um, and so we collect the amount of fees that we're collecting understands that there will be some students who cannot afford to pay who will not be offset by CDGB. We just, we factor that in. Okay, that's... You budget for it. I'm trying to understand that, but... Okay. I think she pre-budgets for it, Jeff. Excuse me? I think she's telling us she budgets for it. Well, where in the budget is that budgeted for? We budget for an entire amount for the school department budget, and we assume we're going to collect only a certain amount of fees. We know that we don't have 100% fee collection. We know that some students are unable to pay. And we know that a portion of that is offset by CDGB, but not 100% of that is offset by CDGB. So you have to come up with, in, in some case, let's say it was 50,000, eight was provided for you. We, we assume that we're gonna get $260,000 in fees. We do not assume that we're going to collect 100, we don't base that number on 100% assumption of paying players. We know that some pay, players will not pay because they, are, they cannot pay. And CDGB offsets some of that, but the rest of it, we basically cover that out of the general fund. The general fund. Okay, thank you. Steve Harrington. Oh. Right, Mr. Tossi is going to move to adjourn, so Steve, I'll save you to next Monday. We'll start the list where we left it off. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We'll start the list with Mr. Harrington on Monday. Mr. Tossi has got a, two or three comments, and then we're going to move to adjourn. Okay, uh, what I'd like to just suggest um, on the rest of the uh, budgets, uh, a lot of questions that you might have, give us a call. We might be able to answer them uh, for you. Uh, call the manager's office, talk to the manager, the deputy, uh, the department heads. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, uh, and we could sort of move through the rest of this. Now, on, on Monday, what I'd like to do, if possible, and it's up to the moderator, uh, is have uh, uh, start off with Minuteman uh, and the superintendent, because he's got to be at other towns when he gets 16 towns to do. So with that, I move that we adjourn. Hold on. We'll... Okay, what's your name? Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. The, uh, wait, wait, wait. This lady, reconsider your name? Lisa, okay. Thank you, Mr. Kaner. Mr. Moderator, the finance chair just asked for the uh, Minuteman budget to be taken first. I appreciate the need for that superintendent to be other way, but we just had uh, our superintendent and several other people yeah. uh, here all night, and I think they should have consideration to be first. Okay, we'll address that Monday. I'll speak to both of you gentlemen during the next few days. I think we should also probably finish up the education budget because right in the middle of it and we only have a few more people then we'll go to Minuteman but we'll make that determination on the evening okay we are adjourned oh all in favor of adjournment please say yes, yes. opposed thank no. you you can stay <laughs>